which of us was free? Oh, Mike's on. You have no idea. Well, welcome to the Bible Beer Consortium. Are they clapping uh, for the Bible or the beer, or both? <laughs> both, absolutely. So, in that order. So, <laughs> anyways, the, we're, uh, the guts were sponsored tonight by the Fairmont Music Hall, and we definitely appreciate the BBC Faithful Remnant members who uh, gratefully support this, uh, this consortium. Ezra Boggs, who usually is hosting, is not here tonight he, due to some employment commitments that he had with the Department of Homeland Security. He's assisting the Office of Response and Recovery with efforts in Hawaii due to issues related to the ongoing volcanic eruption. So think about him when he's, uh, he's trying to take care of some people through that process. We do have some special guests in the audience. We have the DFW Reform Group, Fellowship of Free Thought, DFW Coalition of Reason, and the Metroplex Atheists. You might be outnumbered today. A little bit. Huh? Just, you didn't get any, you know, hoots or hollers the other day, did you? Where's my wife? There you there go. You go. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about tonight's format. It's uh, not an official debate. It's more of a dialogue or discussion, hence why we're sitting around a table with, well, I'm the only one with a drink, you know, so... Maybe someone can take care of y'all a little later. How'd that happen? You know, I don't know. So, uh, but it's more of a discussion tonight. Uh, we'll have uh, both uh, Blake and Matt open up a little bit with some thoughts on the topic, which I'll introduce here in a moment. Uh, and then we're going to go into more like 45 minutes, 60 minutes of just discussion back and forth, which I will gracefully interrupt just so I'm just not sitting up here doing nothing. So, but anyways, uh, that's, and then we'll take a 10 minute break. So go to the bathroom, get refills and the like, maybe get y'all some drinks up here too. And, uh, and then have some Q and A from the audience, I believe is how that will work. And then, uh, then we'll have y'all close out and that'll be the evening. So that's the, that's the goal. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to introduce our speakers or, and, and actually dialogue partners. Uh, Blake is uh, Blake is the founder of beliefmap.org, uh, and, it, and he's an advanced debate simulator for exploring the question of God's existence and Jesus' resurrection. As an enthusiast, he's been studying these debates and cataloging the academic responses and counter-responses for about 15 years uh, to evangelize and aid in the public in navigating the way to belief in Christ. He's helped teach at churches, university campuses, apologetics conferences. He's also premiered on the UK's premier Christian radio program, five times on the Dogma Debate Radio. He's been a guest on several podcasts and engaged in formal debates with atheists on these topics, as well as defend the central true claims of the Christian faith. He's married to his ridiculously hot wife. I'm reading this. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's the truth, according to Blake. I think, Blake, you wrote this, huh? Yeah. It's from the so, belief map page. There you go. <laughs> so he's a ministry partner with him, and he has his hobbies and research include a defeating ga- Ganon. Am I saying that correct? You have not played Zelda? Oh, no, I'm not. I'm a What's wrong with Zelda this? Ga- fan. Ganon. 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 Sorry, Ganon. I apologize. Ganon. So I've totally discredited myself today. I, don't <laughs> know, I apologize. Wait, what, Star so, Wars shirt? Have you yeah, found all the Gurk stones yet? What's that? Have you found all the correct stones yet? No, have you? Not all. Uh, most of them. I think I'm like at 300. <laughs> I'll have to check later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, that, that's a different discussion. Isn't it? <laughs> so anyways, uh, he definitely uh, ping pong players, Super Smash Brothers, Connect Four. Oh, yeah. Right, very good. Uh, Matt Delahanty over here is an atheist activist, public speaker, and a magician. After 25 years as a fundamentalist Christian, Reason forced him to give up his religious beliefs and embrace skepticism, humanism, and atheism. He recently concluded the Canadian and United States legs of, the magic, of his Magic and Skepticism World Tour. He hosts the Atheist Experience TV show, talking, uh, taking live calls from people around the world each Sunday, produces educational videos for his Atheist Debate Patreon project, and regularly travels the world to do lectures and debates on religion, philosophy, magic, skepticism, epistemology, morality, and secular humanism. So with uh, our introductions out of the way and with our format before us for our dialogue, the topic that we're going to discuss tonight is can faith be rational? 
And I'm going to open it up for Blake to sort of open us up here. And he's going to like define some terms, have some initial thoughts, and uh, let him speak for a moment. Then we'll give Matt an opportunity, and then we'll open up the former dialogue and back and forth discussion between y'all. Very good. All right, so first, hey, guys, uh, good to see you all. It's a, a pleasure to be back here uh, with you. I recognize a lot of faces. Um, actually, the first time I was here was with uh, Matt Delonte. This is where we had our first discussion, so it's good to be back. Come full circle. Um, so, uh, right, the topic, uh, is, can faith be rational? And I guess first we're going to have to uh, define our terms or else we're going to be talking past each other. Um, and I'm just going to sort of spitball this. I, I was thinking it was just going to be a straight conversation, uh, but I guess we're going to give about 10 minutes of opening statements. So I'm just going to do what I can to summarize my position. And I guess my general strategy um, in speaking with Matt and, and hopefully adding a little uh, clarity at the beginning that can help us moving forward. So um, I see three terms here uh, that probably need some elucidating. We're going to have to ask ourselves what we mean by faith, what we mean by rational, um, and then what we mean by can. Uh, in, in terms of faith, um, I think that there's a, a, actually a widespread misconception um, among atheists, at least a lot of the ones on the internet community, about at least what Christians mean uh, by faith or the religious. Um, so I know there's a, a poll that was done on radio uh, where two, a, a question was asked, and the question was basically, when Christians use the word faith, uh, do they mean belief without evidence? Um, and this was very intelligently posed to atheists and to believers, to Christians. Um, and it turned out that, what was the numbers? 91% of the Christians rejected this. They said, no, that's not what Christians mean when they say faith. Um, but then when you looked at how the atheists answered in terms of what they thought Christians meant, it turned out that 72% thought that is what they meant. And so there's sort of this disparity between what Christians actually mean and um, what can sometimes be thought of as faith. Typically, I know in the internet community, um, faith is often understood to be, with the qualifier, blind faith. Um, but that's not what we mean. Um, I asked uh, John Mark Reynolds, who was originally going to be at this debate, uh, what he meant when he put this title together, and he said he just means what Christians normally mean when they use the word faith. Um, in sort of folk terms, it means trust. That's all, all Christians typically mean when they say that they have faith in God. Uh, and I think that this makes sense, too, biblically. Uh, so if you look at the Bible there, uh, uh, it's just very clear that it means faith. If you look at... Um, uh, like secular uh, dictionaries and encyclopedias on the Bible, like the six-volume Yale Anchor Bible Commentary, um, it's going to say straightforwardly this is what it, it meant um, for the early Christians and up to Christianity today is faith. Um, same thing for the Oxford Companion to the Bible. It's going to say the same thing. Um, and this is easy to show as well because the Greek word faith, pistis, just means trust. So that's another reason to understand that. And finally, uh, against this idea that it's blind faith, you, Consider the apostles and consider Moses and all the heroes um, in biblical history. They all saw incredible miracles and things uh, that constituted really good evidence for what they believed in. And nevertheless, they are icons of faith. And so for these kinds of reasons, this just I don't know if it should be too controversial that in, in this context, a biblical context, that by faith we simply mean um, trust. Um, so, anyways, if you're an atheist and you're thinking it meant something different, I hope that this uh, clarifies a little bit about what Christians mean. Um, so now, what, what about rational, or more specifically, what's a rationally acceptable belief? What do we mean by that? And th this is, man, this is a huge topic. Um, uh, in the field of epistemology, the branch of philosophy that focuses on what constitutes knowledge and what constitutes rational belief, there is... There's a diversity of views, tons of peer-reviewed literature on this, so um, singling out um, uh, one particular view isn't always the easiest to do, um, but there are some that are very popular, uh, and I uh, am very interested in a pr uh, what's called a proper functionalist analysis, but I think I'm most interested in uh, an internalist uh, a particular kind of internalist understanding. So here, here's how I would put it out. See what you think of this, and we'll, we'll work with it um, over the course of our discussion. But 
Maybe we can say a belief B is rationally acceptable for a subject S at time T if and only if either one, this is two things, but one, B is directly evident to S at T or two. B is evidently well supported by other beliefs that are rationally acceptable for S at T. Well, let me interrupt there. Blake, this is a discussion, not a uh, calculus class. So maybe you can <laughs> unpack that a little bit for us. I'm, I don't mean to interrupt in your introduction, but I, I'm like, I'm totally lost. I don't know what you're talking about anymore. Uh, all, I, <laughs> all I heard was BS. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's an easy joke. Um, okay, so uh, this is a, a recursive uh, analysis, which means that there are two uh, things that you're taking into account. First, you want to find out, uh, hey, uh, am I... Is something directly evident to me in the sense that am I being appeared to in a way that that uh, a tree is in front of me? So how do we know that a tree is there? Well, there's this seeming. I have a perceptual experience, and on the basis of that seeming, I just directly infer that there's a tree there. So that would be an example of uh, a, a direct inference, something that's directly evident to you. But this can work for memory. Um, it can work for intuition and, and knowledge of things like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Um, but once you have some of these beliefs in place, then you have a, a next step. You can uh, take these new beliefs and then use them to build your structure of knowledge. New beliefs can be built from beliefs that you've acquired that way. So that's all, we, that's all I'm meaning. Um, finally, in terms of the, uh, the term can, uh, I think we mean here uh, metaphysical can, metaphysical possibility. And that just means that uh, we're asking, is there a possible world or a conceivable circumstance where religious faith or trust is rational, or it is inherently, or alternatively, is it inherently and unavoidably irrational? I tend to think that's kind of what we're, what we're going to be talking about. Um, so uh, I guess I'll, in terms of framing what we're doing, I've got two general contentions, I guess, two, two things that I think we should consider, and one is it the case that there are better reasons to think that faith can be rational? Or alternatively, are there better reasons to think that faith can't be rational? And I think that's what we should be focusing on. Um, I don't know, for example, whether we should uh, bother too much over whether one or the other can be demonstrated. We just want to have uh, an idea of who has the best case. What's the strongest position? Where does the evidence point most? Um, and I guess if the, if the pro side has the strongest... Um, arguments or the strongest reasons, that, that's, a, that's a reason to move forward, um, move a little bit towards confidence that faith can, in fact, be rational. Um, I guess that's, that's <laughs> as much of an opening as I'd, I'd want to offer, I guess, for now. All right. With that, let's turn it over to Matt. How much time was that? Because that was exactly, that's about seven minutes. Ah, but, um, well he, done. He did very well. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so just for the record, Blake isn't the only person that I can debate. He just happens to be <laughs> one of my favorites, and we got him to fill in last minute when uh, Reynolds couldn't be here. Um, and I'm very happy about that because we always have some of my favorite discussions. Uh, yeah, I don't think we have to spend too much time worrying about maybe def definitions of can or can't. I'm large. I followed the – was, that was a joke, but I did follow the BS and T stuff. And, and I'm fine with the notion that um, – a direct demonstration of something, although we get in trouble when we talk about something that seems reasonable when we're trying to define reasonable. You're going to find that over and over again. And if all you mean by faith is confidence, well then of course, any confidence level in any belief may or may not be reasonably justified. And so if the question is, can confidence be reasonable? Yes. But why not just use the word confidence? If I have confidence or trust in something, I don't ever use the word faith. And what I find in the interactions, granted, more sophisticated theologians, people who've studied by and large, you'll get into various definitions uh, or usages of faith. But as somebody who takes live calls uh, every Sunday from people who just sit in the pew, largely the usage of faith that I get from them is... I don't have a good reason. If I had a good reason, I'd give you a good reason. I just take it on faith. Not necessarily a blind faith. This is why when you look at the study and 91% of Christians say that, no, we're not talking about faith without evidence, and the atheists are like, yeah, that seems to be what it is, it's because 
Nobody thinks that they don't have good reasons for their beliefs. So, of course, if you ask Christians, hey, by faith, are you talking about blind faith, faith without evidence? They're going to say no, because they think they have good reasons. And the atheists who are saying yes are saying, I know you think you have good reasons. I'm not convinced that you actually do. And for me, one of the problems is that when you look at faith, you have faith as confidence, as a confidence level, you have, uh, or, or trust if you prefer. But then you have faith as a methodology. Or when I, when I go through, for example, what the Bible has to say about faith, uh, which isn't necessarily the only reference we should point to, I would agree that if, I think if you took every verse where faith is mentioned, the majority of those refer to it as confidence. Um, or this is what I have trust in, etc. There are, though, verses that suggest that it, it is, it, view it in more of a sense of epistemology, that faith is the reason. You go back to Hebrews 11, where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There are verses like that. And the thing to watch for, because I would agree, can faith be rational? Yes, if you mean you have confidence in something. If you're using a colloquial faith, you know, I have confidence that this chair will hold me. I would never say that I have faith that this chair will hold me, uh, just because I don't want to add to the confusion. And so when somebody is saying that faith is rational, the things to watch for are equivocation fallacies. The things to watch for are, are they talking about, I have confidence for good reason based on evidence, which I can present, and then switching context to the reason I believe is because of faith as if this confidence uh, can extend to be a foundation in and of itself. Uh, I do disagree when Blake said that he doesn't think we need to really bother with demonstrations. I don't know how you could make a case for something being reasonable or rational without a demonstration. To me, that's, that's foundational. Because we know that um, you know, the direct experience may well be rational, and yet you can be wrong. This is something I think we would agree on, that you can reach a, ra a conclusion rationally and it still be the wrong conclusion. As a magician, I exploit this all the time. I'm, my job is to lead people towards what would seem to be a rational conclusion based on the evidence that they have, and yet they're wrong. So tonight isn't really about uh, is the Christian faith or faith in Christianity right or wrong. We've, we've done that before and can do it again. But my concern here is that in the broader context, when people talk about faith, they talk about it in different ways. They say, this is my faith, the Christian faith. This is what I have faith in, or this is what my confidence is in. And then they will use it in a third sense where faith is the justification, going back to uh, Hebrews 11. And so if I had like one of those uh, wheels that you would find at a casino where you put your dollar down and they spin it, and there's all kinds of prizes, and most of them are garbage, and one of them is a million dollars. If you were to say, can you win a million dollars on this wheel? Well, the answer would be yes, assuming it's not rigged and there's actually a million dollar thing on there. But the likelihood that you're going to win a million dollars is something that's far more concerning for me. And if people were to spin that wheel, and say, I have faith that I'm going to win a million dollars, we, we would laugh. And if we, we talk about what needs to be demonstrated, is there likely to be a debate that has as its topic, is science reasonable? Is science rational? Is evidence reasonable? Is it reasonable to rely on evidence? We could get into a loop where I present evidence and argument for why we should consider evidence and argument reliable, and we may never get out of that loop, but at least we can get to the point where it's at least self-evidently convincing. I think we both agree that evidence and relying on evidence is reasonable. But if faith as a justification, as a foundation, which I understand Blake's not defending, but if for those that would, which is what got me to take the subject in the first place, if faith were the foundation, then you would find yourself saying, I have faith that faith is reasonable. Not I have evidence for, that faith is reasonable, not that I have good reasons that faith is reasonable. You would say, I have faith that faith is reasonable. And that is a problem because while I can't demonstrate that faith could never be reasonable, even in that context, um, I could point out a whole bunch of examples where people have pointed to faith as a justification and they were clearly wrong. We're all aware of that. There's a thousand denominations of Christianity. I could have faith that white people are better than black people. I could take any position and root it by just saying, I don't need to present the actual evidence, I'm just going to say that I have confidence or I have faith that this is here. Because if I ask you why you believe something, 
and you have good reasons, you tend to give those good reasons. We don't hear appeals to faith in science. We don't hear appeals to faith in, in history even. I mean, they'll talk about, you know, confidence level or somebody reported this or we, we consider this to be reliably evidenced in this sense. It's only in, as far as I can tell, in the discussions about religions that people make the faith appeal. So, I don't think we're going to probably have a lot of problems with equivocation tonight because he's not defending a notion that faith as an epistemology is necessarily rational. But there's a sub-issue here that which came up even with what you were talking about, which is uh, you said Moses and the, you know, saw miracles that constituted good evidence, except that I have no reason to think that any of that happened, that Moses existed and saw something that con constituted good evidence, or even that if you witnessed something like that, that it would in fact constitute good evidence. Uh, I, I certainly agree that if you saw something, you might r reasonably be led to a conclusion, and we're not going to dick around about whether or not it's, it's a correct or incorrect conclusion. But if all we mean is it's confidence, then sure, I can have confidence in anything. I avoid using the faith label in particular to avoid that equivocation fallacy of saying, this is my reason. And when I went through the list of verses, um, you know, Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask for in prayer, you'll receive. If you have faith, that sounds like confidence. Uh, Romans 10, faith comes from hearing, hearing through the Word of Christ. That sounds like confidence. That the, the, the Word is going to build uh, the confidence within you. Uh, 2 Corinthians, walk by faith, not by sight. And it's probably only the one in Hebrews 11 where faith is presented as the foundation. Faith is the evidence. And yet, I would hope that almost everybody would agree that evidence is evidence. We wouldn't have to give it another label. And that using the label in this way is confusing. I think there would be far fewer atheists who looked at Christian faith as blind faith if by and large, they ran into believers who were consistent in the usage and not jumping back and forth between, I am… Because confidence, you could just be saying, I'm really, really convinced that this is the case. I have a high confidence level that this is true, which is completely independent from whether or not that confidence level is justified and whether or not you reached it through a reasonable process. So, you could have really good reasons for believing something and having a high confidence level. I just… I have a hard time calling that faith instead of confidence, uh, and I don't know where that leaves us or gets us, other than, uh, hey, w welcome to the Bible and Beer Consortium <laughs> discussion on faith. Well, there there nice. you go. Well, thank you, uh, Matt, for uh, I think, obviously, from the discussion, we have some agreement, disagreements, and this is where we can just open it up for dialogue back and forth, for clarity or dis disagreement. Uh, and then exploring those disagreements. So, however you all want to explore this forward, uh, feel free. Can I start? Of course. All right. So, um, a lot of what you said, totally, totally agree with you. Uh, and it sounds like we agree on probably the most important point, in fact, of the, the title of, of uh, this discussion, Can Faith Be Rational? Because we're saying that it, we agree that it can be reasonable for some people in the sense that they can hold a, a certain kind of confidence in it. And given their experiences, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, um, he, he at least testifies to having an experience of Jesus having appeared to him. Um, and this, as a result, um, turned him into uh, one of the greatest evangelists in history. Um, and it was a radical transformation. And so, I would, uh, I, I think we agree in saying Paul, given his experience, could well have been rational. Maybe he experienced something that for him was good evidence. Um, would, am I, are we on the same page there? I think so. If I can, let me kind of tweak this. Mm -hmm. I think it's entirely possible for someone, based on the limited information they have, to reasonably come to the conclusion that they have lucky socks. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean their socks are lucky. And there's a distinction I think we'd make between is their confidence level truly justified? Is it supported by evidence? Or did they reach it through a reasonable conclusion? When I talk about, mm -hmm. you know, doing magic to fool people, that's what we exploit. We, and there was a guy who emailed me just this week uh, to tell me how incredibly smart he was and how stupid I was because he's convinced that psychics are real and he's got massive amounts of evidence, he says, for, for psychics being able to communicate with the dead. 
this is why I make this distinction between, I think you can be entirely reasonable in your process, but incomplete to mm -hmm. the point where you can reach a wrong conclusion. Yeah, good. But what bothers me is that, by and large, when we talk just, you know, in public, I mean, if you look at like a definition of reasonableness, it'll, one of them will just say sound, you know, that this is a sound justified thing, which ties it to true. And so colloquially, we'll just say, oh, that's reasonable. And we mean true. We mean that that is most likely true, rather than you, I understand that you might have a good reason to think that. And I think, those, I think we need to do a better job distinguishing between those two. Okay. And then a couple more comments. Sure. Um, so just so there's no misunderstanding, when I was citing Moses and these biblical figures, um, I wasn't uh, anticipating that you would believe that these were real historical figures. Um, the aim was more to say, hey, what uh, do Christians mean and what did the uh, biblical authors mean by the word faith? And insofar as their biblical heroes, um, all had great evidence and were still considered great men of faith, that says something about what um, early Christians meant by the sure. word. That's if, all. If you're convinced that Moses experienced, you know, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and that he was a an otherwise reasonable person who could have perhaps sawn through trickery or whatever else, then it makes sense to say that Moses would reach a reasonable conclusion that it was God, whether it was or not. The problem is that we start multiplying these uncertainties within here. So now we have issues surrounding Moses. But if we say that Moses was reasonable, that doesn't mean that it's reasonable for you to reach the same conclusion that Moses reached without the direct evidence he had oh, just of because course. he reached yeah, this it. Is just, this is just, I don't think this is controversial. This is yeah. what leads again, uh, biblical dictionaries and commentaries to say this is what was meant by the biblical authors. That's all I'm saying is um, in terms of what Christians mean, uh, or at, le at least academic Christians, I recognize you come across some interesting ones on your radio show. But, um, and I was one, uh, <laughs> and, and I've used it both ways. This is the, I, think, I think maybe maybe some churches are doing a disservice by playing fast and loose with language mm -hmm. because when you hear, you talk about confidence levels. And there are people whose confidence is like, there's nothing you could ever do that would change my mind. Okay, well, then there's no point in us having a discussion. Dogmatism. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, but how many times, you know, have you been in a, a church? I, I know it happened to me all the time where it's, I know that I know that I know that I know. It's, it's this hyperbole of confidence. And if you liken that to why I have confidence that this chair will hold me, uh, which now I don't, I'm not quite as confident. <laughs> but if you, if you put those two in the, in the same category, that's, that's where I think we kind of are misleading people about what we mean. Okay. I have some thoughts there, but um, also I wanted to uh, say something about Hebrews 11.1, 1, that one scripture. Sure. I actually think you, there's a misunderstanding there. The King James Version um, says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. But in modern commentaries, that's, that's done away with because that's not what the Greek word there means. It's the conviction of things unseen. That's what it is in the Greek. Uh, just, so now there's a pretty universal understanding of faith in biblical language. Okay. As, as just. And so if, if I go, well, first of all, all the AV 1611 folks are going to be really pissed that you said that because <laughs> they're only down with that one particular version which guided the bulk of Christianity for the last, I don't know, couple hundred years. Uh, but I'm fine with that, and I'm fine with going to, you know, Greek stuff. If it turns out that the Bible only ever mentions faith in the sense of confidence, um, then I would say everything that we're going to discuss is irrelevant because, quite frankly, I don't care what somebody's confidence level is. You don't have to have 100% confidence in order to take action on it. All you have to do is be convinced. And I'm far more – granted, I just completely derailed the debate. Sorry, moderator. Uh, <laughs> No debate involved. I'm, I'm, far, I'm far more concerned with whether or not something is true, whether or not the confidence level is justified, than what the confidence level is. And so as long as somebody's convinced of something, you could be just like, I could be barely convinced that Moses saw a pillar of cloud. Actually, it, whatever. I, see, this is why I don't do this. Um, what actually concerns me is whether or not the miracle is true and occurred, mm -hmm. and what it would take 
for it to be justifiable for me to accept that that's the case or any modern person, you know, removed from the events where we don't have the direct experience that you're talking about? Uh, so when you talk about justifiable, do you mean um, rational? Well, essentially, I mean, I think there's more to justifiability than, than the BS and T <laughs> short, shortcut that, that you were doing. When I, was when I was doing this, I was going to do the same thing. I was going to give several different definitions of faith and several different definitions of rational. And I was going to mostly skip can because uh, I didn't want to sound like Bill Clinton about what is is. Uh, <laughs> But on rational, it, for me, what I would normally consider rational is something where you have justifiable, plausible uh, conviction that this is true or likely true, that it comports to reality in some sense, that merely being internally consistent is not really that much of value. The people who can become convinced of, that they have lucky socks, they are working with, as far as I can tell, insufficient information uh, to reach the conclusion that they have. So when we say that somebody is, it's almost like we're saying, you're being as reasonable as you're capable of being. And I would like a better standard of that, than that, where in much the same way that um, when the Supreme Court tries to figure out what a reasonable person would do, they don't go to the least common denominator of you know, what the minimally reasonable person would do. They would talk more about you know, an average or what we would expect from someone out in the world experiencing things. I would like us to get closer to that or maybe set the bar a little higher when we're talking about reasonableness so that we're more likely to get closer to truth. Yeah, so, um, so let's like, figure out where we want to go then. Okay. Um, so we agree that given someone's data, they could rationally believe in all sorts of things. Yep. Um, you know, we've been in positions, both of us, where we come to, like, false beliefs that even re in retrospect look ridiculous. Anybody uh, who thinks they don't have a false belief uh, is wrong. Right, <laughs> has a false belief. That's their false belief. Absolutely. So um, maybe, maybe what's worth talking about is uh, kind of, you, you alluded to justification. Um, maybe when can we reach a justified belief in something like God is trustworthy? Um, what are the circumstances, uh, maybe ideal circumstances, good circumstances, sufficient circumstances? Um, are there, are there uh, yeah, how, how would you approach that? Maybe, maybe we can start that way. Yeah, so now I think we're probably getting into why I rely so much on skepticism. And in part, and we don't have to completely rehash this because there was, uh, there was quite a bit of focus of this when you came down to the house and we posted that video. Uh, talking about, you know, what standards of evidence should we have. Mm. For me, if somebody, if you want to just say faith is confidence, okay, now I have to ask a second question, which is what is your level of confidence and why? And it's the why that, that really matters. And you would almost need to, to kind of give a concrete example. My problem is the category that we're talking about when we talk primarily about religious belief. When somebody says... You know, I believe that Jesus is Lord, that he came down here as, as God's incarnation, died for our sins, was resurrected on the third day and rose up to heaven, uh, and, you know, is the price paid for all of our sins. That's a cool statement of faith. And then I would say, why? I don't care that, that you have confidence in it as much as why. Can, can I interrupt? Yeah. Um, so, all day. Just, just to be uh, as precise as possible, what if we worked out maybe an analysis for you of what a, a justifiable belief would look like? Like, what are the conditions under which a belief would be justifiable? So, yeah. maybe we could work something out together and see what that so, could look like. So, without getting all concrete, the one I, I typically go with is the same methods that we would use within science, where a, te a claim is testable if and only if it's also falsifiable. An unfals unfalsifiable claims, I, I don't know how you can have a uh, a justification for accepting a claim that's unfalsifiable. Real quick, so maybe what if, what if we started this way? Um, a belief is rationally justifiable. I think that's what we want to focus on. If and only if, and then how would you fill in the blank from there? Belief is rationally justifiable if and only if. It's probably going to be hard to do on the fly, but... Yeah, and we can work together. Yeah. Um, so... 
yeah, the, the, de facto thing, the, the de facto thing is if there's sufficient evidence. But now you have to say, okay, what counts as sufficient evidence? Mm -hmm. And one of the most common questions I get is, what would change your mind about God? And I have to answer, I have no idea. Because I don't know how to tell the difference between an incredibly advanced technology and a God. Mm -hmm. Because that would, I would have to know more to be able to understand the difference between them. Mm -hmm. So for me, and you can find a way to phrase this better than I can, Rather than trying to narrow down exactly what would be sufficient evidence, because that's going to change based on the nature of the claim. You tell me you got a, a new dog the other day. I'm just going to accept that as face value because it's mundane. Mm -hmm. It is, I know people. I know people have dogs. I know they get dogs all the time. Yes, I was just with an awesome dog right before we got here, uh, Opie. Uh, but the, see, the dog distracted me. So the, this issue of sufficient evidence, for me, we talk about Paul and the road to Damascus experience. Mm -hmm. Anything of that nature, I don't know how you could justifiably come to a conclusion about the source, because how do you rule out that this wasn't some delusion to you? So one factor is definitely independent verification as much as possible. Um, it is contingent upon how extraordinary the claim is, how much evidence and what type of evidence. Let me, let me see what you think of this. This is me looking at some of the stuff you said and tried to pull it together into an analysis and see if this sounds similar to what your view is, and then we can modify it as we need to. Blake is going to Reader's Digest my brain. So when, <laughs> the, when the book's done, uh, I'll give it to you first. <laughs> so what do, what do you think about this? A belief that X exists or X explains Y is rationally justifiable only if, and here we have two things, X is demonstrated to be possible and the belief is a deliverance of a reliable method. Sure. So I'm thinking that's, that's the heart of it. And then we ask ourselves, what does it take for X to be demonstrated to be possible? And here's where I, I'm going to need some help. I've, uh, it might be, I've heard things that sound like, well, it's uh, demonstrated to be possible um, if we have past confirmations of it, or alternatively, maybe of things like it. How would you flesh I, I'm, that out? I'm fine with categorical similarities. You know, it's, so like the, the wheel example I used, it's pretty easy to figure out what's possible on the wheel because it's all marked. But if we covered up everything on the wheel and they spun it and then they revealed what it was so that you couldn't calculate what was possible beforehand, you might still be justified by knowing, hey, there's 50 other casinos in town. They have similar wheels. Nobody's going to let me put down a dollar and give me a 50% chance of winning a million dollars. And so there's inferences about how these sorts of things work where you could come up with a reasonable uh, conclusion about what's likely to be possible on that particular wheel. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to have specific calculable information. Inferences are fine, and categorical inferences are fine as well. Uh, so in terms of demonstration, uh, you're, say, say, say that again for me. The, if, how would you understand demonstrated to be possible? When, when do we get that? that? That is when the evidence from a reliable source... Uh, yeah, now we're, now we're caught um, because you can't go with like, I don't know, maybe for the purposes of this, you can say that it's self-evident, obvious, because I don't think we need to get down to is reason reasonable mm -hmm. or, you know, is something, are my senses reliable? The way I tell whether or not my senses are reliable is by getting independent confirmation from other people. I mean, I can say, hey, is that a glass of water? And, you know, we can investigate it in a number of ways. We're going to directly collect evidence we are going to compare it to what we know. We're going to seek independent confirmation and, when possible, replication. Okay, so um, we're demonstrating uh, that X is possible if it's self-evident. Are there any other examples where something might be demonstrated to be possible? I have no idea. Okay, so like... Um, are there? So uh, what about, um, like... Uh, Where we, we disagreed before was whether or not something is possible until shown to be impossible and whether or not it's impossible until shown to be possible. Yeah, and so my position is it's neither until that's demonstrated. So, like, um, what, do you, what would you do with historical facts? Can we demonstrate um, in, in this way? Is it rationally justifiable to believe in a historical fact? And can we demonstrate um, that some historical facts uh, have occurred? Do, do they meet the... the definition of demonstrated? It'd have to, because everything is a historical fact. Even if I talk about what happened 
10 seconds ago or five seconds ago. I mean, it, it's history. Granted, there's a recording. If we go back further in history, the only thing we can do is rely on inferences and the reports that we have. Mm -hmm. But like, um, think of uh, like Alexander the Great says, you know, we have a report. Alexander the Great gave this speech. These are some of the words of the speech. The report, the source seems reliable. Um, uh, is that an instance, have we demonstrated that Alexander gave this speech or said something along these lines? So I would, I would suggest that it's probably best not to even talk about it in that, oh, we have, you know, we've done this. Well, it would be better to just say, we have reports that Alexander said this. And it, it depends in part on what was said. It depends on part on who's reporting it. You know, one of the things when it comes to, like, independent confirmation of historical figures or potential historical figures is, are the reports we have all coming from one side of a story versus two sides? And if you have, like, the pro-Teddy Roosevelt and anti-Teddy Roosevelt people writing something and they're in agreement, then I think that we have a much stronger reason to believe that that is an accurate representation than if it's a biased source. Yeah, so uh, I'm still, I want to, I really want to understand what you mean by X is demonstrated to be possible, because I know in our conversations you've mentioned it a lot, and um, I want to pin down an understanding of, of what it is for something to be demonstrated, because I, uh, maybe uh, by demonstrated you could say something like, hey, uh, there is a high likelihood of it being true given that, given the data that you have, given well, that's, the that's evidence it. you've come across. So now you're going to likelihood of being true, which is separate from possible. So if I have a six-sided die, a standard one that we'd find there, is it possible for to roll two? Yes, because that's part of the demonstrated, or the, part of the definition of that, and we can demonstrate it by doing it. It gets a little more complicated as we get out of there. Is, is it possible that there's a diamond, you know, buried in my backyard? I don't see any reason why we should conclude it's impossible. Uh, we know that people have buried diamonds. We know that diamonds exist. Every aspect of that is independently possible, and so the collection seems like it's, it's possible. This has nothing to do with how likely it is that there's a diamond. It's just, is it possible? Uh, you know, uh, epistemically possible, sure. Materially possible, yes. Um, is it possible that there's um, an alien from Alpha Centauri buried in my backyard? We, I have no way to conclude that that's possible because I don't know anything about aliens from Alpha Centauri and whether or not they even exist or existed, whether or not they could have traveled, you know, this distance. There are too many independent variables that are not verified. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to try to demonstrate that something's possible, I would say that you would need to show that the primary variables are independently possible. Similarly, if you were going to try to show that something is impossible, you would need to show that the primary variables are not possible. Uh, um, and sorry, what did you mean by primary variables? Well, the, it, within the terms, diamond, okay. yard, buried, w all of these things we know. We know people can do this sort of thing. We don't know whether or not there are aliens from okay. Alpha Centauri. Okay, very good. And so, and, and for people who are like, why are they even talking about this? Um, because this relates to the, the grand question um, about whether, th you know, some religious beliefs... Um, can be rationally justified because if a criterion of a rational or justified, let's focus on justified, a justified belief in something supernatural requires first the demonstration of possibility, <coughs> and if um, demonstrating possibility means doing this thing over here that theists haven't done, then the end conclusion is, is that theists can't or, or a person can't justifiably reach um, belief in, in the supernatural, in the supernatural. Yeah. And, and that's, that's kind of where things are with you, right? That's, that's oh, no, why I, you want to... I'm full on on record both in our discussion and in multiple videos. I know of no way to demonstrate that, that the supernatural is real or is even possible in much the same way that you, we would say, is it, when, we, when you, you'll occasionally use Bayesian analysis for, matter of fact, you're going to be debating a friend of mine in like two days, I think, right? I, I didn't know y'all were friends, but I, it yeah, sounds like I, it. Yeah, I did a show. We, we disagreed about morality, but he's oh, awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, and free will. We disagreed on two things, but we got it sorted. Uh, if we say God is the best explanation, I have an objection in the sense that we haven't demonstrated that God is even a possible explanation. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about is it possible that a God exists, 
I put that roughly in the same category as Aliens from Alpha Centauri, only I would ar have to argue that Aliens from Alpha Centauri are necessarily more plausible than a god because at least they're natural, at least they're potentially within the... There's nothing, there's no appeal to some violation of the laws of physics to get to an alien, whereas that might be the case for a god. And, but it, all, it depends on the definitions. Can I put my cards on the table, kind of my... my um my thinking on this. Yeah. So uh, the, the way it comes across to me uh, is that, hey, I've got um, a nice, academically rigorous, standard way of arriving at uh, beliefs. And according to these standards, um, at, you know, abductive, inductive, uh, deductive reasoning, and, you, and like you said, in, in the inductive category, I'm a Bayesian. Um, these are these are really well developed methods for arriving at truth, and if you use these methods um, as they're used in academia, then there's no there's no problem arriving at the conclusion of a god as long as you play by the rules. And the thing is, is I there's no rule that corresponds to what you've in the past identified as being a rule, namely that it, it is demonstrated first, and so. Just so, so we're on the same page so that you can help me, um, I'm, I'm standing here and I'm like, uh, if, if what Matt's saying is true, if this is a really good method, I want it. I want that thing. But it, it's nowhere to be found out here, and I don't know why I should accept it. So here, here's what would be mean my... it's nowhere to be found out there? It's science. No, I don't think it's science. Science is methodological naturalism. It makes no. It can. It can make no statements about no, the supernatural. Th well, this principle. So this principle isn't in science. That before you can infer that X exists, you have to demonstrate that X is possible. No, that's not what I'm saying. Let's go to the Higgs. Mm -hmm. That was an inference to the existence of something. Mm -hmm. But the there was there was no. The, the constituent variables of that were known physically. There, there's no violation of anything that, that we know. There's no reason to think it's impossible. We then begin an exploration for it. We may find it, we may not. If we don't find it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But if we do find it, it does. Mm -hmm. And so this is a testable hypothesis that is essentially falsi falsifiable in the sense that if we found something else, that would show that the Higgs isn't the explanation that we thought it was. And we, we had this label. We didn't have to first go out and say, we need to demonstrate this is possible. But until such time as there was a demonstration, it is not rationally justified to accept it as the explanation or even a, a, a likely explanation because there's no demonstration of likelihood there. Let me... So here's how it comes across to me. So I, I'm, here I am, I'm presenting to Matt the case for God, and I'm giving what seems to me to be like really good evidence is over the course of our we had three formal debates so far. Yep. Um, and I, I'm throwing out all this data that I think fits on theism, is more probable and expected on theism than on its negation, on atheism as, as understood um, canonically. Um, and you, and, and whenever I present these sorts of evidences, uh, you come back and you say, well, and there's this catch-all philosophical objection. Um, regardless, uh, you can't conclude that God is the explanation of that until we demonstrate that God is possible. Correct. And in, in the case of the Higgs field, here's, and tell me where the disconnect is. So what would be analogous in the Higgs field situation is someone's giving you a bunch of evidence um, for the Higgs field, and then you're saying, well, before we can demonstrate that there's a Higgs field, you have to demonstrate that there is, I don't know how, it, you'd have to demonstrate that there's a Higgs field first before you can give evidence for it or before you no. can... No. Yeah, help me out. That, where am I I'm missing saying it? that you would have to demonstrate that there's a Higgs field before it's justified for you to accept that the Higgs field exists. Not that it's a potential candidate explanation, but before you... So the time to believe something is after there is evidence for it, after there is reasonable reason to believe so, that it is the best explanation. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. So you can give mountains of evidence that you think is consistent on theism, but that's an intellectual panacea. If it's, hey, we need something that is, is uh, sufficient to explain the origin of the universe, God is sufficient to explain the origin of the universe. Of course it is. 
Of course, it is a, it's been a proposed explanation forever, but the time to believe that God is the best candidate or that it is the candidate mm -hmm. is after there's direct evidence for that. It's so, what, so what's the direct evidence for, you, you might have to know some history of science, or do you, do you know the direct evidence for the Higgs field? From the, uh, the observations from, the, um, from CERN's uh, particle collider. Okay. Yeah. And, and so what those observations, presumably you say it's a demonstration of the Higgs, the Higgs field or the Higgs particle. I'm, because, so I'm not quick, convinced exactly what it demonstrates. Okay. I'm talking about what is being reported as the, you know, the standard okay. scientific explanation. But the way you're doing it is you're saying here's some data from CERN. And this data is more likely on the hypothesis that there's this Higgs field than on the hypothesis that there is not one. And I'm doing the exact same thing when I make the case for God and say, here's my data. This is more likely on the hypothesis that God exists than on the hypothesis that God doesn't exist. Except that there's nothing... So there's nothing about the Higgs field that necessarily violated any understanding uh, of the way the universe works. That's not true for the supernatural. The supernatural, by definition, violates everything we understand about nature, which is why, and, and it's like, we've repeatedly tested claims of people who think they can do things that they label supernatural, psychics, dowsers, whatever else. It, let's say dowsing, when we tested it, actually produced reliable results. All we would then be able to say is that hey, these guys can do something we don't have an explanation for. We could then begin, you know, hypothesizing about what natural explanations there were, but we can't begin to hypothesize about supernatural explanations because we have nothing to point to where we can say, here's what the supernatural is. Here's how we've confirmed what the supernatural is. This is why it's a candidate explanation. That is the exact opposite of what we have for natural explanations and potential fields and anything else. So whether the Higgs field does or doesn't violate our understanding... Um, is going to have to do, in my opinion, because I'm a Bayesian with our background knowledge. And so when you tell me that theism violates our understanding, I'm going to say, wait a second, it doesn't violate our understanding. It absolutely does. What, what evidence do we have that there's anything other than the natural world? But that, that doesn't mean it violates my understanding. It, okay. You might as, how do you know that Narnia is not real? I don't have any evidence for it. I don't know that it's not real, but I'm I don't. I don't know that it's not real either. I don't know that Narnia is not real. I don't know. You know. I mean, I suspect it's not. The, right. the evidence for that would be, hey, this seems to be a fictional invention of somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but skipping back and, and jumping to science, uh, this is going to piss off some of my physicist friends. Sorry. <laughs> uh, string theory is magic, as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it's been demonstrated. I'm not convinced that it's falsifiable. It, to me, is an intellectual exercise amongst mathematicians, people looking for, or physicists, looking for the best explanations. But even in that context, there's nothing about it that, while it may rewrite our understanding of the natural world, there's nothing about it that necessarily violates it. And when people propose a god, what they're, what they're proposing is something that is timeless, spaceless, that exists completely absent of all the things that we directly observe. And that's why it doesn't count as a candidate explanation until such time as it's been demonstrated. When you go to, uh, you know, when you've got a particle collider, you're doing an actual physics test there, and what we call it or what we label it, or whether it's even a field, whether there's strings, wh however we, we, tr we choose to conceptualize these things, are independent from here's an observation, here's what we think the best explanation is for it, uh, I have a friend who's working on a reworking of, of Big Bang cosmology, saying essentially the Big Bang cosmology is wrong and there's a new math model that fits it better. But even when that happens, it's not going to change the data that we already have and it's not going to propose something that, for which we don't have reason to believe. So here, here's, just so you can step into my worldview again, um, you're saying that the relevant difference is that the Higgs field doesn't violate our understanding. Um, this again, I, and I'm having, I feel like I'm having to consult, I, I'm consult you sure. almost as a prophet on, on your method because I, I can't predict what you're going to say. I don't understand how theism violates my understanding. Uh, it doesn't, vi this what is the violation? The, wow, what is the violation? Theism proposes something other than the natural world. How do we test for 
identify or confirm something other than the natural world. This is why science relies on methodological naturalism. It doesn't say the supernatural doesn't exist. It says we don't get to make appeals to that because we have no demonstration that it exists. Quick, we have Matt, no way to... Real quick, Matt. Um, you're saying that, yes, theism does propose something other than the natural world, and then you ask, how do we test for it? But my question was, how does theism violate our understanding? There's not a violation so, so there just because... So you're getting hung up on this thing about violating understanding. Uh, it, it, that was the particular words that I used, and maybe it's not clear. Um, independent of what you understand, there is the direct observation in the natural world. If you want to propose a bunch of candidate explanations for an observed phenomena, mm -hmm. then your candidate explanations need to either be something that we know about, something that, that can't, you know, we explain things in terms of other things that we already understand or identify. We... I, I don't think that's accurate. Because uh, um, there's lots of stuff in science that's really radically new um, that can't be explained in, uh, by making reference to those other things. That, I mean, maybe you'll just have to elaborate on what you mean by that. So, for example, if you're... Is there something in science that's so radically new that... that or, or, or it's, when we talk about what, what is an explanation for something, and I'm talking particularly about causality, mm -hmm. you make a list of candidate causes. If this table is on fire and we say, what's the explanations for this? You know, you've got matches and blowtorches and all these things that we know about. Uh, those are all going to be more probable than spontaneous table combustion, for which we have no observation and no understanding. But if, if we had no other explanation, we would then be at a point where w the answer is, we don't know. If someone comes along and says, ah, well, there's nothing about this that violates my understanding of God can make a table Tell burst. You. Hang on. I'm sorry. That Go God ahead. can make a table burst mm -hmm. into flames. And you can say that all day long, and you can say we've been unable to come up with any other explanation for how this table burst into flames, but my God can do that. And so that becomes a plausible explanation. You do that all day. It doesn't mean that there's any good reason to think that that is even a possible explanation. Okay, so a few different steps. I actually think the Higgs field is a great analogy. Um, I would love, in both cases, I think the right approach is, as you know, a, a standard Bayesian approach. I don't think we need any of these rules. I think we just do basic academic Bayesian analysis, um, and you end up asking yourself, what's the likelihood of this data on the hypothesis that there is a Higgs field? What's the likelihood that on the hypothesis that there's not a Higgs field? And you do the same thing for theism. There's no rules that would prevent theism from being a candidate if yeah. you use standard abductive reasoning and standard uh, Bayesian inference. That's where I'm coming from, and I don't know why I should add on extra What is criteria. the likelihood of this hypothesis on magic? That's, that's vague, so I don't know what that means. On magic? What is it? But that's not a proposition. It, it needs to what be a What is the likelihood of the table catching fire on a, wiz a fireball casting wizard doing it? The, Isn't the, it pretty much 100%? Well... On the likelihood that, yeah, it's 100 percent, yeah. Okay. And so, so if the model, if this, if this proposed, you have to do, you have to, you have to take in. Remember, you know this before I even say it. You know that you take whenever you do a Bayesian analysis, you have to take into account the priors, and then you have to take into account the likelihood of the hypothesis um, given the evidence, and then the likelihood of the hypo of the hypothesis. Or excuse me, yeah, the likelihood of um, the hypothesis being. Oh, I'm getting it backwards. Sorry. Continue what you're saying. Okay. So the table bursts into flames. Mm -hmm. On the hypothesis that this person is psychically able to cause a, uh, the table to burst into flames. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then we have, we, we know that on that model, mm -hmm. this is entirely plausible. And of course that's going to fit as an explanation. How likely is it that that person can actually cause things to start fires with their mind? That's the thing that we care about. This is my problem with going through this Bayesian analysis is that when you have an intellectual panacea, something that can do all, or when you have something that is sufficient and you have no other explanations, of course that's going to appear to be the best explanation, but we seem to be ignoring the fact that the best answer is, I don't know how that table caught fire, and I can't reasonably reach a conclusion about what the cause was or likely was until I do an investigation. And until I can show that this person can start fires with their mind, it's not even a candidate explanation for the functional reality that this table caught fire. And just to clarify, do, oh, you, think, do you think that um, 
Uh, is this like a critique of, of Bayesian analysis itself? Or no, it's, is a, it... it's a critique on usage of Bayesian analysis. Bayesian analysis is great for yeah. medical research and figuring out probabilities of what the, you know, from a number of candidate options of how likely this is. It's good for a number of other things. I don't think it, it, it should go anywhere near the territory of the supernatural or cosmic origins because, first of all, we have one universe, so we've got no priors. We have no way to confirm how likely... It, it may be that on theism, a universe like this is 100%. But that doesn't tell you whether or not it's the right answer. Because on I'm cheating it cards, the likelihood that you're going to get 13 spades is 100%. And yet, it is, we know it is the case that we could legitimately shuffle them and you could still get that. So there's a difference between what the probable explanation is, and maybe I'm not that good at cheating. I am mm. really good at cheating at cards. Uh, but when we're talking about what it's reasonable to believe as the best explanation for this, I don't know how we can ever get to the sort of panaceas that we're trying to inject in yeah. there. So you're, and you're, you're capitalizing when you talk about the wizard example on the fact that if you invoke in a, hypo in a hypothesis that's sufficiently ad hoc, uh, that has a sufficiently low prior probability, then of course you can produce the data, but you've transferred all of the improbability over onto the hypothesis itself. Exactly. Um, and this is, this is something you have to take into account. And I think that when um, so many theists who are publishing on this um, answer that question, look into that, they do look into the prior probability of these issues and the prior probability of God's existence, because that's an important component. And where, okay. So I'm not aware of anybody who's made a case for the prior probability of anything supernatural. Uh, Callum Miller just uh, published a paper exactly I, on, I, on the prior probability of God. I, I'm aware that there are people who claim about this. But I'm, I'm interested in how do you determine, how is it that you investigate the supernatural beyond an, internet, beyond an intellectual exercise, beyond a, hey, here's all these things that we don't have an explanation for, which would seem like they could have potential supernatural explanations. Where is the investigation that shows of the five million times this has happened, 5% of them were supernatural. You, you're assuming here, I think, that you have to approach probability as a frequentist, and that doesn't comport with a Bayesian analysis. Bayesians uh, are, don't have to be frequentists on this. Let me, so when scientists Do they have use, to rely on quick, when, actual evidence? Real quick, when, when scientists use Bayesian inference, um, you can start with different priors. Consider that Stephen Hawking and, and Lawrence Krauss and Sean Carroll are all incredibly smart physicists, and yet and they disagree. Yeah, and I actually mentioned them precisely yeah. because they're atheists. That's why I mentioned those ones. Yeah. So we agree that they're incredibly smart physicists, but they have radical disagreements on things, even if they have the same information. How do we account for that? What makes sense of that? Well, what makes sense of that is the fact that they have different priors. And what Bayesian analysis does, of course, is forces them to expose those priors and be clear about what they are. But as you continue the Bayesian process, and as you continue to pull in new data, they're going to be converging on common answer, uh, answers. That's the whole Bayesian project. So, I mean, when you poke fun at, at these instances where what's the likelihood of a wizard doing it, I mean, I have a, a very, very low subjective uh, probability assigned to that. Me too. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, in fact, such a wizard did do it, um, and these wizards even exist. It doesn't matter. You can start with whatever subjective prior you want. Typically, you um, structure them in part by looking at um, what's called the principle of indifference. You have objective ways to inform it in part. But you can have a subjective prior. All that matters is you continue feeding evidence, and you're going to be updating your probability, and it's going to be converging onto the truth. Now, I mention this because you can you do the exact same thing when considering theism. Do whatever you want with the prior probability of theism, now look at the evidence, and if enough evidence accumulates, you get to the conclusion that theism is probably true. And that's all we need. We don't need any, other, any of these other criteria to do our rational investigation on the issue. So when Hawking, Tyson, and Carroll get together, and they have a disagreement about something, and they start going to the evidence so that they can converge on something, um, the thing that they're going to is evidence, doesn't seem to be remotely in the same category of what theists are advocating on behalf of evidence. If that were the case, then those three, among others, would have converged towards theism in the same way that those arguing on behalf of it would. And we would have 
you know, the Templeton Foundation not, wouldn't be the only one giving prizes. You'd have a Nobel Prize for this sort of thing. If, in fact, what, like give an example of a piece of evidence that, that begins to converge towards theism. The, uh, the fact that the universe is life-permitting, given our knowledge of how improbable a life-permitting universe, a life-permitting uh, set of physics is. Okay. But, but the thing that you're talking about there is life seems, we, we know that life seems improbable, which actually isn't necessarily the case. We know that the building blocks of life are abundant and the criteria for life uh, are just present in the universe. And so... Wait, sorry, what? The universe... No, no, I'm not talking about the, the design of life. I'm talking about the laws of physics themselves being fine-tuned. Sure, but you don't have any evidence that they could have been any other way. You, you, and you, you live in the universe that produced this. You, you do, the way you do that is you can look... Physicists do this. This is not contentious among physicists that the universe is fine-tuned. I know you'll mention uh, Victor Stenger, but he's on, he's a, he's Victor on the Victor Stenger, fringe. Lawrence Krauss, Neil Tyson, I can call a couple no, of them. No, I don't, I don't think, I don't, are, are you sure Neil deGrasse Tyson says that there's no fine tuning? Correct. Okay, that, I, so, I, I, well, here's the thing. There are people who will acknowledge an appearance of fine tuning, not, everybody's gonna acknowledge the anthropic principle. There's no denial that we fit the universe that we're in, that the universe had to have these specific physical laws for, for life to arise here. That, that's not, that's the anthropic principle. That's not even, there's no contention yeah, on that. Past it, right, it's yeah, I'm going to actually interject here in. because we are actually now moving into actual arguments for and against theism, especially with fine tuning. I'm actually going to try to Imagine how that happened. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I thought it would probably, you know, evolve into that, but I'm going to just try to rail this back in. I'm going to go back to some of your opening statements. <clears throat> Matt actually said, and I'm pointing this towards Blake. It said, it's only when we talk about religion do we discuss about faith being rational. We never talk about science being rational. What would you have to say to that? Um, I mean, I would say, but we do talk about scientific theories being rational. So we can talk about whether evolutionary theory is rational, whether string theory is rational, whether various multiverse models are rational. And in that regard, it is like the theistic hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Now... Are, are you confusing a theory and a, and a discipline, though, when you say talking about a certain scientific theory might be rational or irrational versus the very discipline itself being yeah, rational? Yeah, but I guess in that case, since we're talking about trust in God, mm -hmm. that resembles um, a theory or a proposition. So this is a, a belief in something. So rather than resembling a discipline, um, this is, we're, we're talking about a belief itself. So just as we... Um, have uh, this belief or trust that God is trustworthy, so too we can have a belief in some theory in science. And we can ask ourselves whether it's rational to believe in that. Mm -hmm. For the record, we're in complete agreement there. Yep. Um, in the sense that the foundation of science, the, the methodology that, that undergirds science, we're not going to talk about whether that's rational in the same sense that if we were talking about whether or not faith as an epistemology were rational. Those, those things are going to be different because yeah. I don't see that. But on a particular model, uh, and I, I said that wrong, but I'll get back to it. On a particular model, you can say, does this reach, does it use the most reliable methods and, and reach this conclusion? And of course, you can have debates about that. That You can have debates about the model just like you can have a debate about whether or not the, the Christian model or a Christian model or a Hindu model or whatever else might be an explanation. And this is why I was fine with the notion that if all you mean by faith is confidence, then it can be rational. But if you mean it as a methodology, as a foundation to lead to truth, as a, it is an epistemology, that's where we have an issue. And science has a path to truth. We're not going to have that, you know, is science a good way to figure out the universe? Duh. I mean, I agree. no, but we're in agreement there. Yeah. 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 yeah and I, I do agree. Very good. And now I want to come back to something you said earlier as well, is you said, Faith is confidence. And I don't know, maybe you might have just agreed that, that that's a, 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 just as good as a place where it is trust. But is, isn't that talking about the psychology of someone and not the actual thing itself? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to explore what you mean by that, uh, by faith. If it's just confidence, uh, then we're really not talking about something being rational. We're just talking about some, someone's psychology. Well, you can, you can determine, I, I agree with you, uh -huh. there's a psychology, uh, psychological component to it. 
I, I might have a confidence level. Let's say I'm 80% convinced this chair will hold me. That confidence level might have been reached through a reasonable process. It, and colloquially, we'd say, ah, oh, yeah, Matt's got good reason to think that this chair, you know. Uh, but it's not just about, this is why I was saying earlier, I want us to get, not us, but us as a society, yes. to get beyond this, this person is as justified as they can, they are as reasonable as they can be, and talk about a standard of reasonableness that goes beyond a least common denominator or anything like that. And so when we say, I have confidence, we're, I agree we're talking about a different thing. I have a belief, I have a confidence level in that belief, and then I have whatever reason I have for having the confidence level in that belief. That's independent from I have a belief, I have a confidence level, and my confidence level is appropriately proportioned to the actual confidence level. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And, and I wanted to follow up on that. But he said no, though. No, you did? Well, let, let's, <laughs> let's explore Wait, what you, it. What, yes, absolutely. What, what did you, in the last sentence, you uh, proportion? I have a belief. I have uh -huh. a confidence level. It's a separate issue as to whether or not my confidence level is reasonable based on the information I have or whether it's reasonable in comparison to the actual justifiable confidence level. So like if I, if I spin the wheel... Okay, but and no, I think you don't I'm, need to elaborate. I, I think okay. if I'm understanding you, I think I... If I think I have a 50% chance of winning when I actually have a 2% chance of winning, then it, I could have reached that through reasonable means, but I am so far removed from what confidence level I should have Got it. Okay, that good. that's a separate issue. Okay, excellent. Sorry. All Sorry right. to interrupt. Uh, now, given that, uh, f from the, c the discussion that you and Blake have been having here, it didn't seem that you had a c problem with faith being rational, but if b uh, having belief in theism is never a possible explanation, how could it ever be rational then if that's not an option? So one more time? Using the supernatural to explain a body of evidence, like Blake is trying to do with the okay. Bayesian theory, and you're saying, no, we can't do that because we don't have any priors or demonstrable, uh, demonstrability of its possibility. This is about the two types of reasonableness I was yes. talking about. Um, I can completely understand how otherwise reasonable people with insufficient information could reach the conclusion that something supernatural has, has occurred. I do it all the time. I did, did it last night in the magic show. Hand somebody a book, pick out whatever word you want. I'm not going to look. I'm going to be over here and everything else, and I'll tell you what word you thought of. For people who don't have enough information, it is perfectly reasonable for them to come to the conclusion that I can actually read their mind. I can't, but it's reasonable for them to conclude that. But when we talk about the best explanation is that Matt can read your mind, the, the independent confidence level in my ability to read minds what it should be is independent of what that person thinks it is. So they, they could be like, oh my gosh, I can't come up with any other explanation. It must be the case that Matt reads minds. And in fact, if they had just a little bit more information, they would come to the quick conclusion, holy crap, Matt's just faking it. Mm -hmm. And I can understand how and why people reach those conclusions. I'm not saying they're being unreasonable. In, in the case of magician and mentalist, you are, I am intentionally causing them to be deceived. Outside of that, in the world, we do this to ourselves all the time. We lie to ourselves, we have faulty memory, we reach conclusions quicker than we should, we do it on insufficient evidence, and we also, in the psychological aspect, if you've reached a conclusion, and let's say I'm not completely convinced, I don't want to be rude and say you're an idiot, um, you're foolish, and I also don't want to say you're wrong, because you might be right, I don't know whether or not you're right. And so we build up these insular environments is where the psychology comes in to where, of course, it's if I'm standing in church and I get goosebumps like everybody else and everybody else around me is saying, oh, that's the Holy Spirit, then it was reasonable for me, based on the information I had, to conclude that that is the best explanation. But it's not actually, as far as I can tell, the correct one. And with more information and more exploration, we may find that my confidence level was in incredibly inappropriate. We've got about 10 minutes before we're going to take a break. So any other things y'all wanted to sort of hash out before we go into that, before we move into the Q&A? Yeah. Uh, this would be a good opportunity. I think when you say that their credence 
level or how it, what was inappropriate you just said just now? Confidence level. Their confidence level. Yeah. Okay, was inappropriate. Um, in what in what sense was it inappropriate? Are you just saying that they were in the objective sense? So as a, as, as a me with my limited knowledge and understanding, I can only assess the information with this, which is why we don't, which is why we rely on independent uh, verification and replication and things like that when, when we can. It may be there is some confidence level that is warranted for any reasonable person with perfect understanding. There's a different confidence level that may be warranted with, for any reasonable person with limited understanding. Real quick, if they had perfect under, understanding, um, then the confidence level, I guess, would be one in all true propositions, right? I don't accept that a confidence level of one is necessarily possible, but this is why I want to talk about max, maximal confidence, because I can't... But if they're maximally reasonable, then they can just see the truth. It would be like... Internally, it's 100%. All, all it's truths, the extra. Yeah, all truths would be like one plus one equals two, right? Yeah, and, but this gets back to something we'll have to discuss another time, which is whether or not you can have absolute certainty about anything, which is why I talk about maximal certainty. Uh, however certain you could possibly be, whether it's one or 99.999, repeating, there are things that you can be maximally certain about, like math and you know, deductive reasoning, things like that. Or anything that comes from that. Mm -hmm. It got real quiet. It sure <laughs> did. Yeah. Well, let's do this. We're right there on the verge of uh, about 50 minutes of discussion. Uh, so let's move into our break. We're going to take about 10, 12 minute break. I do have an announcement to make uh, as we go to break. Please go spend lots of money at the bar. Yay. Make sure to tip and throw lots of money at the bartenders, Joel and Maddie. So I don't know if they texted this to me or not, but we do appreciate them opening up this forum to us, and we'd like to support that, support the establishment that way. So let's take a 10, 12-minute break, sure. and we'll come back for audience questions. Thank you. So uh, the Q&A, we do have a mic right up here, right fr up front. Uh, the only thing I ask is you sort of direct your question towards uh, either Matt, to Matt or Blake, though I will give both of them opportunities uh, to talk about it or even discuss it. You know, very, very open. That's how we want to sort of keep the evening going in a more discussion dialogue format. I do try to keep the question short. I'll even let y'all dialogue a little bit, you know, but as, if I see a line forming or something like that, I might say, well, let's move on to the next person, though we only have one. I did, I did notice when we... But when we Started our break, uh, Matt said, well, the hard part's over, now I can get my margarita. So, <laughs> well, with that, uh, go ahead and come open uh, up with a question. Hi. Um, as you know, the way we discover uh, if there's historical evidence in ancient literature is we look, we use the criteria of embarrassment, like we're pretty sure Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. John Dominic Cross has said if there's anything historical, it's that he was baptized in the Jordan River and was crucified. We use multiple attestation if we have a lot of independent sources. And uh, Matt here has seemed to go to the historical side, which is good. But here's the problem is, let's say you were reading a book by R.L. Hubbard that was a biography written by a Scientologist. How much faith would you have in that book? Not a lot, because it would be so high, highly biased. And this is what Christians don't get. When you read the New Testament, you are reading a book that is highly biased. They had a theological ax to grind, and you're not reading an objective account. They didn't have someone from the First Jerusalem Post there to record the events. So my question to you is, how can we have faith in such a high... And by their own admission, they say, we are writing this so you might believe. How can we have faith in a document that's so heavily biased? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I think that sometimes people who are heavily interested in the topic because of their bias, so think of like a Holocaust survivor, precisely because of their interest in it, actually put in extra effort to make sure they get things right. Um, there's also a, a background point that it's actually almost impossible to get rid of all of your biases anyways. Everybody writing has biases, even in textbooks, and, and you have to control for bias and, and, and do your best. Um, incidentally, some of those criterion you're talking about, the best criterion, the criterion of dissimilarity and the criterion of um, embarrassment that you mentioned, 
capitalize on bias. So the point is, is precisely because they'd be biased not to say this because it embarrasses them, the fact that they're saying it goes to show that we should uh, assign a little bit more likelihood that they're telling the truth here. Um, now, of course, you apply other uh, tests to make sure that what they're saying isn't just something they genuinely believe, but it's actually true if you want to get down to the history of it. Um, but overall, I don't think that it, I'm too worried uh, about the fact that it's written by biased persons, because historians deal with that all the time, and, and they can work through it really well. But you know the great demythologizers like uh, Strauss and Boltman uh, mm -hmm. in the 19th century, the great German scholars, what they did is say, yeah, there's historical truth in the New Testament, but Jesus walking on water, the miracles and all, we just throw them out. You're familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. So why can't you just do that and accept the, you know, the bare bones history? Oh, I mean, you saying. absolutely could if that were, I, I mean, you can do whatever you want. I just don't think that's the rational um, thing to do, especially if I suppose I have really good reason to think that God exists and so therefore that miracles are possible and I have some really good reason to think that um, God's interacting with Jesus or even raising Jesus from the dead is the kind of thing that God might do. Then when I come across some historical evidence that testifies to these sorts of things, um, I can probably take him a bit more seriously than someone who lacks those background beliefs. And this is why, by the way, Bayesian uh, approaches are so important. You have to take into account your priors. You have to analyze those priors. Uh, you can't just um, uh, like leave them unanalyzed. Um, but uh, when the whole thing is done, um, I, I think that you can very rationally uh, believe in miracles through looking at historical evidence. And Boltzmann and these guys were, um, were, ve were very mistaken, as even contemporary non-Christian scholars were saying. There's far more in it than they could have ever anticipated that is historically Can reliable. I hear from Matt? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to shock Blake too much to let him know that I'm actually largely in agreement. So I'm not a mythicist. All right. Um, I'm kind of ambivalent, okay. and I find the question of the historicity of Jesus rather a curious one because it doesn't matter for almost anybody in history, but it absolutely matters for this. And while I, you know, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, we know they're not actually uh, as in sync as oh, no, we would like, yeah. but there's good arguments being made on both sides because let's say they were all in absolute agreement on every detail. Well, then you would argue that that was collusion or fantasy or whatever. And so I'm fine with some of the standard apologetics that are saying, well, of course we would expect differences being that these are different people writing around similar events. There are also real problems in trying to reconcile the different accounts of, of the Easter account. Um, but the, the argument that's often made that these differences strengthen the reliability I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the idea that, that the reliability of this account may be strengthened by differences and it may be strengthened by unity. My, question, my issue isn't so much how, whether or not it's strengthened, but is it strengthened sufficient to warrant accepting the broader claims? And I don't see the value in attempting to disregard, to say, oh, well, there was a person and he said these things and we have these recordings, but let me just disregard the miracles because miracles are garbage. I mean, we, we know miracles don't count. That's not skepticism. Skepticism is I have no idea whether or not miracles are possible. I need sufficient evidence to do it. So I don't get to disregard that. When I look at the New Testament, I have to look at all of it and say, I don't get to just throw these out. I don't get to pull a Thomas Jefferson and cut out all of the, the supernatural things and just keep the parts I like. I have to look at the whole picture and figure out is there sufficient evidence to justify this? And for me, and I would argue absent appeals to the supernatural that I don't think are justified, there simply isn't uh, to believe the account. But, hey, thanks, guys. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so really quick question about Bayesian analysis. Uh, I'm actually paid to give them. Um, and I never present them. Because Sorry, you're actually what? I'm paid to give Bayesian analysis. And oh, cool. I never present them. Oh, cool. Never, ever, because they are great bullshit magnifiers. They're incredibly <laughs> good at magnifying my biases and making me think that I'm right when I am horribly wrong. Fun so, fact, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to raise money on a GoFundMe to have uh, Blake change his middle name to Bayesian and put it on his license, because <laughs> I think that would be awesome. I so mean, really quick question for you, Blake. Yeah. Yeah. Really quick question. Have you applied the same Bayesian analysis 
to the Greek mythology. Have you looked at what that gives you? Mm -hmm. If you apply the same starting conditions to Greek mythology and your same assumptions to something that we all, I think, in this room agree is total bullshit, what did you get? Okay, so thank you. Um, a couple quick things about Bayesian analysis just for people who aren't aware uh, of its canonical status. So this is a, a quote from Robert Matthews um, in Scientific American. He says, um, in recent years, scientists have become more comfortable with the idea of priors. As a result, comma, Bayes' methods are becoming central to scientific progress in fields ranging from cosmology to climate science. Um, in Nature Magazine, Colin Houston and Peter Erbach uh, um, published a piece. They, they say Bayesian scientific reasoning has a sound foundation in logic and provides a unified approach to the evaluation of deterministic and statistical theories unlike its main rivals. One more thing, Scientific American, this is Chris Wiggins. Bayes' theorem is at the heart of everything from genetics to Google, from health insurance to, health, uh, to hedge funds. It is a central relationship for thinking concretely about uncertainty. So you're saying it's, it, you know, it's... It, Four words. But go ahead. All right. As one who's done this many times. That's five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> no. Four words for Bayesian. Garbage in, garbage out. Good. And, and we would both agree with yep, that. Yep, I, I absolutely agree with that. So you do want to be responsible about what you put in, but you have to understand that when a lot of theists... Um, and people in the philosophy of religion are publishing in this, they're very well acquainted with the calculus, and they, they work hard to analyze their priors very carefully. Now, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but what I am saying is, is that there are rules, there are things you can apply, and again, when people start from different places, they can still meet in the middle. So, very careful, you have to be very careful about your priors. You have to be very, very careful that when you're looking at them, and this is a thing that everyone does, is what you think is true is always the thing you put down. You have to be very, very careful that it's not just you that thinks your priors are correct, but the broader scientific community. I, so if you're wrong, let me, let me. you're going to be very wrong. <laughs> I, so I agree, and so does he. And when we've had conversations about Bayesian thing, one of the things I point out is that from a mathematical standpoint, I'm not qualified to actually assess this stuff, but you don't have to be mathematical to come up with uh, your priors, and you can be as forgiving as you want. Let's say that, you know, like, oh, there's only a 1% chance, even though he might be personally convinced there's like a 90% chance, he can go with a 1% and show what this thing's, I, what the results are. I have concerns I know you can pick out, hey, here's a guy who did a Bayesian analysis that says Jesus existed. Here's one who came, did a Bayesian analysis that says it doesn't exist. And neither of those are actually true because they're listing probabilities of, uh, on a hypothesis. My concern is that I think it's a great tool. Just like you can lie with statistics all day long. Statistical analysis is great. Mm -hmm. Samples are great provided you get good sample size. You can, you can do surveys, but a survey is not going to tell you necessarily what the people in my neighborhood think unless you actually survey the people in my neighborhood. And where I have problems with Bayesian analysis, apart from the fact that I'm you know, not, not remotely an expert, is while it may apply in fields from cosmology to climate change, I have no good reason to think it applies to the metaphysical. That's actually pretty fair. Yeah. Um, just <clears throat> another you know, word of caution here. Um, any statistical method, you're standing on a limb whenever you do a statistical analysis. You're, you're out there on a limb. You need evidence to confirm your statistical analysis. Otherwise, it's You could lose an election. Um, <laughs> actually, yes. Um, now, Bayesian analysis, you're not standing on a limb. You're very, very quickly, you end up standing on a twig. So you have to be very careful about every step. Of you should the email Blake. Yeah. And, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, and again, that's why I'm saying you just have to be careful. Uh, Bayesian analysis, a, a lot of people think that we are, our brains are actually Bayesian, much like, um, you know, children are able to learn grammar in a, a way that isn't always um, sensible from the evidence that they have. And there are these structures in the brain that allow them to uh, learn very quickly. And in the same way, even, and yet, you know, those same children would have a really hard time in school learning grammar, but they can do it. And in the same way, a lot of people think that our brain just naturally and very fluidly, if subconsciously, is doing Bayesian inference all the time. Um, and 
I, I mention that because I think that it's the right way to update beliefs. I think it's mathematically rigorous. We can, um, we can look at its very plausible axioms and we can uh, say, hey, this probability calculus works. And if we, here's what a Bayesian analysis does for us, is it exposes our biases and it makes sure that we are very clear about what we're doing and, it's, and it, everybody can see it. Okay. Go ahead. Strong recommendation, apply the Bayesian Next. to a number of different problems. <laughs> We got it. I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I hear stuff like that, that we, that we, our minds intuitively do this. Or I'm a little cautious about that, about labeling it Bayesian in the same way that you could argue that we do calculus. Anytime somebody throws a ball and you actually catch <laughs> it, you could say that in some abstract sense your brain does calculus. The truth is your brain didn't actually do calculus. Um, it's just calculus is what's used to describe the math behind what you did. Yeah, but. And, and of course there are people that take exactly that position. I haven't researched it enough to know, but I know that, that people come on both well, sides. Well, I have, damn it, and I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be right about something on Bayes, but yeah, no, I don't. Uh, this is directed at Matt. I have a question about possibility and probability. What standard for possibility would you use other than pure logical possibility? Because you, you seem to have some kind of a other category that you're trying to, to analyze a claim, uh, a hypothesis about whether it's possible or not, what, what standard, other than just pure logical possibility? It's a demonstration. So the, first of all, the difference I have between possibility and probability is probability is a, is a calculable thing. Sure. Possibility is, is kind of binary as to whether or not this is the case. Um, for me, I, I think possibility needs to be demonstrated, and I also think impossibility needs to be demonstrated. I'm not convinced that something is possible until there's a demonstration of that, and I'm not convinced that something is impossible until there's a demonstration. Those are two separate claims, even though those are the only two possibilities. My position is I'm not convinced of which is, I, either of which is correct. It's like, now I, I know you, I'm not quite to what you asked yet, which is what is the standard? I don't know how to describe it other than a demonstration. Um, that demonstration, is going to be different depending on what we're talking about. Is it possible for this die to roll a six? You can demonstrate that by analyzing. You don't even have to roll the die. You can look at it and understand the basics of physics. As long as something is, um, well, like I was saying earlier, that if it's in the same category as something that we've demonstrated as possible, like you could line up 18 dice here, and I, uh, dice, and I would be able to say that, you know, based on what we understand of physics and dice, et cetera, you could point to any one of them and say, is it possible for, for it to roll a three? And my default is going, could be, which could be wrong, could be like glued to the table and never roll, but my default is going to be yes. Uh, logically, it is possible for that to roll a three based on the definition of the die, the physics, and other stuff. It's when we branch out of stuff. Is it possible that unicorns exist? Well, it depends on how you define unicorn. Is it possible for there to be a horse with a horn? I don't see any reason why that would be impossible. Uh, I don't know that it is the case. But from what we know about genetics and the way creatures grow horns, I would say a horse with a horn is possible. Now, if by unicorn you mean a magical being that only virgins can approach, I, have no, I not only don't have good reason to think it's possible, I have good reason to lead me towards the idea that it might be impossible. So are you saying it's an un, the distinction between the kind of possibility you're talking about and logical possibility is undefinable, there's no way to define possibility? It's claim dependent. Not all claims are, are the same. And so th the more extraordinary it is, the more evidence you would need. And the more factors that are in there, you know, th there are some claims that are simple, you know, one plus one equals two. There's others that are more complicated, like why did I choose to have a margarita today? Um, <laughs> there's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot that goes into that. And if you just said beforehand, is it possible that Matt will have a margarita today? Well, of course it is. It's possible in the sense that we know that these things happen, or at least I know that these things happen. <laughs> um, for something for which we have the individual variables, Matt, margarita, you know, does he drink, blah, blah, blah. For something that we don't know the individual likelihood of any of those or, or that any of those are possible, we don't get to put them together. As soon as you inject, is it possible for an alien to serve Matt a margarita today? I have no way to know if that's possible or not because I, there's a variable in there that we have no demonstration of possibility. And so my position is not that's impossible. It's I'm not convinced that it's possible yet. 
that makes sense? Sure, let's <clears throat> be along the conversation. Thank you. Sure, yeah. anything to add, Blake? Well, I was just gonna say here, it's important to introduce a distinction between what gets called epistemological uh, possibility and metaphysical possibility. So um, when it comes to epistemological possibility, which I think is what you mean when you talk about something needs to be demonstrated possible, uh, by epistemological possibility, we mean from a point of view, it sure seems like this is possible. Um, so there are some, uh, uh, like, let's see, uh, there are, give, hold in your head like a really complex mathematical equation and then an answer, okay? okay? It's epistemologically possible, perhaps, when you look at that and you say, yeah, I guess it's possible that that's the answer because I don't know otherwise. But then there's this other thing. Um, ha logical possibility, and this is true regardless of what you think. Um, and so I think it's important to make the distinction, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you're trying to figure out what he means by possibility, which of those two is he going for, um, and my guess is you mean epistemological possibility when you talk about, um, before you can say something's epistemologically possible, or that we ought to regard it as epistemologically possible, we need to demonstrate it perhaps through showing either prior instances or it sounds like um, showing that the parts of what it's made of are possible, something like that. So let me see if this, this clears this up. And I'll ask this both for, for both categories. When you say you look at an equation and you see this equation and the answer, and the question is, is it possible that that's the correct answer? And you say yes. What if I were to ask, that, is it impossible that that's the correct answer. Would you also have to say yes? It's, it, well, no, I mean, if, it, if it's the answer, then necessarily it's the answer. It's impossible for it not to be the answer. No, no, no. We have an equation, uh -huh. and you're looking at it, and there's an answer out here, and what, what you said was roughly, it's, I guess it's possible. Yeah, epistemologically so, possible, right. Is it also impossible? Yes, it's, epistemologically, okay. it could be one or the other. Right? Sure. So when we talk about epistemological possibility and possibility, they're essentially equivalent, which is why I care more about the demonstration of what is actually possible. So in, in an abstract sense, when we're just thinking about it, you know, x plus y equals 75. Is it possible, logically possible, that 75 is the right answer? Yes. Is it logically, po logically impossible that 75 is the right answer? Yes. Is it actually the case that it's the right answer is a completely separate thing? But if we're looking at it and this inference that we make about what we know about a, a formula that's there and the potential pool of, of possible answers, mm -hmm. if it's both logically possible and impossible, doesn't, doesn't that mean that you that mean one's kind of irrelevant? You mean it's epistemologically possible? Sure, possible. epistemologically both possible and impossible. Doesn't that make that one pretty much irrelevant? And now all we care about? Well, is whether it's empirically? Well, if you get to the point of agreeing that it's epistemologically possible, that's at least a step forward in the program of discovering truth. Because but we some just people, agree it can be both. Well, real quick, because some people, it, the, um, the notion of epistemological possibility is important because there are instances where you might hold up in your head a proposition and someone could turn around and show you a proof that that is in fact impossible, in which case it is not, no longer an epistemological possibility. Right, it's what? It's epistemologically impossible. Right. And, and it's logically necessary. And the other category of possible? Oh, metaphysical. Metaphysical right. possibility. So once they've shown that this is, this is necessarily the answer, or that it is impossible that it's the answer, or a demonstration that's possible. So we get to a demonstration, now we're talking about metaphysical possibility. Um, we will have then we'll have shown that it is epistemically necessary that it's metaphysically necessary. Okay. <laughs> I, I got you. Somebody else. So I think, we, I think if I, we would have shown we're, we're, the, that the, it's epistemically uh, necessary that it is metaphysically possible. Yeah, and I mean, very simply, the metaphysicals out there, you're here, the epistemologicals in here, yeah. and basically if we can latch onto this, they're going to be the same thing. Yeah, but that... That epistemological, if, if we have, and the answer is, yes, it's possible, yes, it's not, po or impossible. That, that both of those are, po it's possible that it's possible and impossible. In that sense, then that's essentially useless. 
I don't, I don't, how could something be possible and impossible at the well, same time? Well, you're the one that acknowledged that that's oh, the you case. Oh, you mean, sorry, you mean yes. epistemologically yes. possible. Okay, yes, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, so continue. So that makes, that renders that fairly useless because it doesn't tell us, uh, it actually it doesn't, doesn't tell us anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, once you've established that it's epistemically possible, then, then sure, then, then I guess there's no point in even talking about its episte uh, epistemic possibility because you already agree that it's possible, sure. Okay. And now I'm, I, was, I was about to quote Tommy Wonder, and so only magicians will get that. But let's go on to the next question, because I don't want to hold everybody up. It's possible we could have more questions. Mm -hmm. Very likely. Um, so, Blake, I want to try to recap your first statement on rationality to make sure I have the right understanding of it. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, you have two axioms on this, and one is that based on direct observation, the, it is rational to have an understanding that such and such a thing is true. You gave an example of a Do you, do you want me to tree. read it again, just uh, so <coughs> clarity? Is, I, is this I, the I BST thing? Your, yeah. I remember your words I like pretty it. well, uh -huh. um, and I agree with them. I just want to make sure that I understand it correctly. Uh -huh. So is that a fair, a fair approximation of, of what you said? I honestly don't remember the precise words that you used, but okay. nothing you so, said jumped out at me okay. as being, oh, that's not right. Uh, essentially, that, that your, your first axiom is that based on direct observation and experience, it's rational to conclude that such and such a thing is true. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't use the word axiom, but yeah, if B is directly evidence to S, if, if yeah. a belief is directly evident to a subject at a particular time, then it's rationally acceptable for that subject. And then the second part of that is based on other, uh, uh, other stacks of evidence in that same way of the first one, even though it's indirectly observable, we can rationally conclude that that one is true too. Uh, I, I don't follow. What are you saying? So, <clears throat> uh, your your second statement was that based on. Here, I'll just read it. Okay. So, um, the whole thing: a belief B is rationally acceptable to a subject S at time T if and only if one of these two conditions are met, or or yeah, either one actually. If either condition are met, right. one. The belief, B, is directly evident to the subject at T, and I mentioned what direct, directly evident meant, mm -hmm. or alternatively, B is evidentially well supported by other beliefs that are rationally acceptable for S at T. Right, so the, a, stack of, a stack of beliefs based on the first one. Yeah, so basically, right, right you get so, that for your so, foundations, so and then the you The first one's up. deductive, the second one's inductive. You're, you're not quite, so, no. So, so uh, here's, here's the example that you, you brought up a tree, right? You're uh -huh. walking down a sidewalk, you observe a tree, you touch a tree, mm -hmm. and you hear birds and all, and this is a tree. Now, in, a, in another situation, you, you're walking along, you feel shade, you hear birds, and you go, there's a tree here. Except it's not a tree, it's a cell phone tower disguised to look like a tree. Mm -hmm. How can, and this question is for both of you, how can you rationally come to a conclusion and ensure that that is not a false conclusion? So um, you're, the scenario we're picturing here is that something that seems just like a tree but isn't actually a tree and the question is, is it rationally acceptable for someone to believe that's a tree even when it's not? Right. And I would say, sure, they'll be mistaken, but it's rationally acceptable. Right, and, and, and I'm not arguing that. I'm asking, I, I'm, I'm f this, this is a false conclusion. It's totally rational that I got to that conclusion uh -huh. based on my prior experience and the evidence that I'm seeing, but I'm lacking a piece of knowledge to have the actual truth of the situation. So how do I, or anybody, avoid rationally coming to a false conclusion? So are you basically asking, how do we deal as rational agents going through the world with the problem of philosophical skepticisms? And these are skepticisms like, man, how do I know that there even is an external world? Maybe what's happening is, is this is my dream world and there's just nothing to wake up to. That's solipsism. No, I, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't. So yeah, that's, that's, that's way out there. 
<laughs> so, hey, there's a tree, there's a cell phone tower, and all we're really concerned about is making sure that we don't misidentify a cell phone tower disguised as a tree as a tree. And the answer to that is, um, first of all, from, from Hume, who is my go-to and the only philosopher I think anybody needs to spend any time on, the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. And by belief, what we're saying here is your confidence should be proportional to the evidence. And so it's perfectly acceptable for if I'm walking along and maybe I'm blindfolded and unable to investigate, for me to rationally reach the conclusion that this cell phone tower disguised as a tree is a tree. Except that the conclusion I should really be reaching, which you will appreciate, is it is probable that this is a tree. And as soon as you do that, and you apply skepticism to where you are going to continue to investigate and explore this to the limits of your ability to gain information, we know that I can, if I have access to not necessarily the entire universe and information of the universe, but if I have access to all the information that I could attain from investigating, I would be able to tell the difference between a cell phone tower disguised as a tree and a tree. And so the, the, the answer to your question, which is going to irritate everybody, is you don't stop investigating and you don't reach a conclusion about what it is until you get that level of evidence. And what you do instead is as you progressively get closer to that evidence, you proportionally, uh, you proportion your confidence level that it is a tree or a cell phone tower disguised as a tree to whatever evidence you have. It is a never ending pursuit and all you should be doing is holding tentative views that are as, as proportional to the evidence as possible. Yeah. And, and, of, and of course, this is something that's you know, pretty unanimously agreed upon, that you want to proportion your beliefs to the evidence. One um, interesting thing, and this is something you know, we won't necessarily have time to go into here, but when you say that um, you believe you can see a tree, and based on the seeming that it's a tree, um, conclude that it's epistemically probable that there's a tree, this would make use of, in order to make that, that uh, it's not a leap, you would have to have something in your background knowledge that says, my cognitive faculties are reliable. If they're reliable, then when I seem to see a tree, then that would warrant my belief that it probably is a tree to some degree. And what's interesting about that conversation is um, that's something that, that, you know, theists will spend some time on because they want to ask all the time, well, man, theists have a good reason to think that there's a, a well-ordered world and a well-designed um, design plan for the human mind so that when they run into these situations, they don't have to worry as much about skepticism. Um, and one of those interesting questions that people are always talking about nowadays is, is if you're a naturalist, can you uh, trust in your cognitive faculties? It's a really interesting conversation. The, the way to figure out whether or not I can trust my cognitive faculties is to get independent confirmation. And in particular, to get in independent confirmation from people I, that don't necessarily agree with me on my conclusion. So if I've concluded that it's a tree and you're convinced it's a cell phone tower disguised as a tree, if I go to you and get independent confirmation of the individual data components of that, set the conclusion about what it is aside, but we can agree that, hey, there's a wire here, we can you know, assess that. Even if we come to different conclusions, I can now be confident or reasonably confident that my senses were accurate in, in this because you are getting the same information. The fact that we might come to a different conclusion has more to do with the baggage and biases we have. So I can come to a conclusion about how reliable my senses are. It's so good that you know now I'm 49, I need glasses to look at my phone when I haven't needed glasses ever. Uh, we can tell when, some, when something's an optical illusion. We can tell when we're getting auditory illusions. We're really good at that, and it's because of things like independent verification. If we only relied on our own experience, we would be a mess Very because good. I would just think that the world was blurry. Yeah, good. And, and I mean, so yeah. when, when I say that they're, they're saying that this is an interesting question, the kinds of challenges they're talking about are a little closer to the one like the solipsism when I was talking about where you can't use the independent confirmation. Yep. And there are lots of interesting variations that might plague the atheistic worldview. So, for example, um, uh, some argue that if anything like naturalism is true and consciousness uh, has anything like a chance of pervading the universe, then hey, it's very likely, in fact, that you're a simulation. There are arguments along these lines. Or if some of the most prominent cosmological models without a beginning are true, then it's actually very likely that you're a brain that actually just fluctuated into existence just now, 
believing you're in the middle of this room having a debate and you're about to, you know, fluctuate right back out of existence. Yeah, they're unfals unfalsifiable. The problem is that the theistic propositions don't resolve it because they're still contingent on, if you are that brain, you could also believe that you are a god or that you are in a universe created by a god that gives you the epistemic justification to believe you're not that brain. Yeah, so a couple of things. So there's, there's a few more to, you know, that, that could be gone through, but here's what you want to make sure to do. Here's where theists might come back and say, but what's important is to make sure that your beliefs are not in probabilistic tension. When you look at the theist's worldview, insofar as he believes in a god, he can manage all of these skepticisms because of his basically belief in a, a benevolent circumstance that is handed down by God. Whereas um, the naturalistic worldview doesn't have a tool like that to help reduce the tension. And so the, some of the discussion is, holy smokes, it, it could be really awkward to be an atheist walking around as an atheist when there's no thing that functions like God to help him out. Except, That's the thought anyways. Except from the theistic standpoint, it is the belief that there's a God that does this. That, mm -hmm. And there's nothing, there's nothing about the belief that is prohibited under an atheist worldview. So the thing that a naturalistic world would have that would provide that epistemic comfort is fantasy. I can, I can come up with a fantasy that says, for me, I have no solution to the problem of hard solipsism. I have no way to de demonstrate to myself or anybody else, if there is anybody else, that I'm not a brain in a vat. However, I can imagine, or I could even be convinced that I have a justification that gets me out of this trap of hard solipsism, and yet I still can't demonstrate it. It is, it is essential, this is where you get to the presuppositionalist. You have to presuppose something. I, I presuppose that reason is reasonable, because that's really handy, and everybody seems to agree. But, but this isn't, these aren't issues of reason. They are the issues of the undergirders of reason, about whether or not your experiences are reliable. If I'm a brain in a vat, I could still have a fiction playing in my head that I'm not a brain in a vat, and that I am epistemically justified in accepting this because there is a God who loves me, whether that God exists or not. It's like, it's like the, the, the invisible friend that the kid has. That can prov and I'm not, I, I never say this to be dismissive or bullying. An invisible friend can bring legitimate comfort to a kid if they sincerely believe it. It can, it can alleviate all sorts of trauma and other things. It may in fact be a good thing in perhaps small doses. I see that the, the possibility still exists. If, if in fact I'm right, and I, I am, but no, if in fact I'm right, and, and there, I, I live in a world where there's no God, I can fully accept that somebody like Cy Ten Bruggenkate or another presuppositionalist can certainly derive comfort and internal consistency for logical grounding by appealing to a God, whether a God exists or not. I just don't think it solves the problem in an actual sense, it solves a problem in the philosophical sense. Let me say one last thing, and then you can have the last word, and we'll, we'll just go next on. Questioner. But um, I actually don't think you can just assume that I'm reasonable and, and get out of the problem, because a lot of these things don't assume that you're unreasonable. For example, a Boltzmann brain could be completely reasonable, it's just that the environment around him is misleading him. And this, you have several variations of these skepticisms that in fact require unique different assumptions to get out of them. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna assume something, what, what's really nice about theism is it's one simple assumption <clears throat> that gets you out of all of the skepticisms at once. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. The, there's nothing simple about that assumption because you and I both are under the position that we accept that reason is reasonable. You're going a step further with the biggest unwarranted, unjustified, catch-all assumption Remember, ever. I didn't say that. I didn't say anything about Do you not think re reason is reasonable? No, that's what I, what I was just trying to explain is that we can grant that you're reasonable. The issue is, is that the skepticisms will attack you from different points. Some of them will question your reasonability. Others will question your environment and your ability to reach reasonable sure. conclusions, even if you're reasonable because of the environment is sabotaging your ability no, to no, do I'm so. No, no, I'm only objecting to the notion that Presuming that there's a God that serves as the answer to all of these things, mm -hmm. it's simple in the sense that you're only proposing one thing, but it is a co very, very, very complex thing that you are proposing, something with immense capabilities to resolve all of these things. This is, this is something that Dawkins pointed out talk, as well. I would love to yeah, talk about that. We'll do that another time. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, I think I have the most important question of the night, and that is, uh, <laughs> will you guys get together with Steve and have him play The Legend of Zelda so he'll know oh, who Ganon is yes. and not embarrass Necessary. himself again? Yes. I haven't turned my Switch on in a couple months because I've been traveling, so you can borrow it. Matt yeah. and I actually were not... We are talking about The Legend of Zelda not long ago. That's, our, that's just what our Facebook chats look like. Okay, so, yeah, if you could get Steve on that, I think that would be I appreciate really yeah. that, right. Brandon. That's, so, that'll help me out. Right. I've got to relearn the game at this point, I think. <laughs> and it can be any of them. It doesn't have to be Breath of the Wild. But, I mean, you know. It has not? to be Breath of the Wild. Come on. All right, anyway, so moving on. Um, my real question, and uh, I'll mostly direct this towards you, Matt, but, Blake, if you feel need to assume the mirror of the question and answer it as well, please go ahead. Uh, so I love how you guys talk. I mean, I've heard you guys vote together on multiple topics, multiple debates over the past several years, and you always approach each other with uh, a good humor, good respect for one another, and I think it's because of that I can ask this question. So you both seem to appreciate the sort of reasonableness of each other. Now, you obviously disagree on where that reason takes one another, how you evaluate some of the evidence, things like that. Um, but Matt, would someone like Blake, who is not so much a, a blind faith person, I mean, he obviously does his homework. Uh, he's not someone to shy away from the positions of the other side to try and read them carefully, uh, represent them charitably, things like that. Uh, what is it you think he's missing in his rationality, you know, in his processes that keeps him from getting to where you are? And Blake, if you want to take the same question for Matt afterwards, I'd love to hear what both of you have oh, to say about great. that. Oh, this is great. Um, thank you for the question, not for the applause. Uh, although, thanks for that too. Uh, I have no idea. Every time I think I know, it, it gets derailed. I will say, and this is a bit of a dodge, there's a video on my Patreon project. Blake was gracious enough to come down, hang out at the house. We sat on my love seat. <laughs> and, and we had a, a, a great conversation. There was a moment when we were talking about how you would go about demonstrating something, where I talked about, imagine that the two of us have sat in this room forever. There's no window. There's no door. And we've never been outside. And you're telling me that there's somebody on the other side of the wall who can move things in here with their mind. How would we go about testing that? And he came up with a great, what I would say, starting skeptic answer to how we would test for that. You know, this, this person would communicate to him what he was going to do, and then it would happen, et cetera. There's a bunch of problems with it, because there's problems with anything, you know, when you're going down these roads. Um, but there was an aspect of this that I pointed out, which is, if we've lived in this room forever, and there's no doors, no windows. It's a presumption that there is a wall, that there is, in fact, another side of the wall. How do you demonstrate that the walls and the ceiling and the floor don't just go on forever? If you want to tell me there's somebody on the other side of the wall who can do something, you would need to first demonstrate, I would think, not necessarily first. I keep saying first, and I probably shouldn't. One demonstration that would be necessary would be that there is, in fact, a wall that there's another side to, and not just infinite. It's like the boundaries of the universe. As far as we know, you know, maybe there's a multiverse, maybe there's any number of explanations, but you would have to demonstrate that there could be something beyond the boundaries of our universe. And when he talked about the, the, the telepathic person conveying what they were going to do and then doing it, and then I asked, uh, and I, you'd have to go back and watch it to find out exactly how this was, I tried to get to a point where I was talking about how is this functionally different from claiming that there's a God who can do these things? This is the same thing I'm talking about when I say, what, can this guy start this table on fire with his brain is functionally identical to the table's on fire because God did it. I have no way to distinguish between the two, and so I cannot reach a conclusion that God is a more probable explanation than that he's, you know, fire starter. That acknowledgement that I don't know how the table caught on fire. I don't know how the universe started. I don't know what's beyond the boundaries of this room that I'm in. And there needs to be a real strong demonstration before I can say, yes, I think that's the best answer. I don't know what the actual roadblock is, but there is something foundational to the difference in the way we look at grounding our epistemology that I hope in the coming 40 years that we, I won't be around that long, 15, 20 years, that we have these conversations. I hope we can get closer to finding it out, but I don't have an answer to your question despite rambling for five minutes. <laughs> um, I got to echo this. That's a wonderful question. It really, you know, that's something we should be asking ourselves all the time uh, to each other, as well as to each other. Um, uh, 
First thing I got to say is I, I think Matt's IQ is probably through the roof. He thinks incredibly quick, and I couldn't throw enough praises his way in terms of how intelligent he is. Um, I think where he goes wrong, as I've alluded to in our discussions, um, is down to the method that he espouses. Um, you know, he says, well, it's, it's just science, but it's more than that. It's actually a very complex method. Um, it's not, you know, the Bayesian method. It's not anything that is standard. And that's part of what my strategy was that I wanted to do today is I really wanted to nail down all the pieces and it just didn't seem like it was going to work um, well. But um, I would, you know, I, I guess I think at the end of the day, I don't think the method is justified. And I think that as we would work through it, here are all these counterexamples, things that aren't demonstrated but are clearly rationally believed or at least not demonstrated in a way that um, meets the conditions he's thinking. So that's, I actually think it's, you know, despite Matt's intelligence, it's the method um, that's causing trouble. And I would recommend some more canonical methods instead. And in quick notes, you're always welcome to come back down and we can hash this stuff out. There's an interesting thing here, in much the same way that when we talked about the actual subject of this debate, can faith be rational, where it turns out we don't disagree on his definition and we don't disagree on mine, on his, on his definition of confidence, yes, it can be rational, on mine of as an epistemology, of course it's not rational, uh, there's not disagreement there. It's curious, if you were to ask my mom this question, what is it that Matt's got wrong? She would give things like, Matt is in denial of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. If you were to ask a former preacher of mine, he would say, Matt just hasn't had the direct experience with Jesus that I have. It's one of the reasons why I love having conversations with Blake, uh, which I'll keep doing. I don't care how many people complain that we're the only people we ever debate. Uh, it's because those aren't the answers that I get from him. And all of his answers prompt thought and further discussion, whereas the type of answers you're going to get from my mom or a former preacher are basically just roadblocks. It, it reminds me of a debate I did in uh, Canada where there were two preachers up there who essentially did this argument of God will reveal himself to anybody who does so, you know, with a, you know, open heart, blah, blah, blah. And, and I got pretty ticked because how dare you suggest that I didn't sincerely and honestly seek God as much as the dude who found God because God found his car keys, you know. Uh, there's clearly a problem here. That statement from that preacher is essentially... I'm right and I can't possibly be wrong, so the fact that Matt hasn't experienced what I've experienced and, and reached this conclusion means that there's something wrong with Matt. Matt's hardened his heart, he's turned his, you know, and this is similar to what you get from my mom, and that's not the kind of conversation we have, which is why we can keep doing this. I'll never debate my mom in public. <laughs> <laughs> Word of advice, I don't think anyone should debate their mom in I'd public. Like to stay on, <laughs> I, I'd like to stay on good terms with my mom if I can. Is there, I just directed towards Matt. My question is, uh, uh, what is your explanation for the origin of the initial singularity of the Big Bang? And then how do you, how is your faith in whatever that is rational? I, I don't know. I don't have an explanation. I don't have any expertise in the area. Um, I accept, and this is the best way I can put it, I accept that the best explanation we current have, currently have for the origin of the universe is summarized by Big Bang cosmology. Um, I have a friend, as I mentioned earlier, who's currently uh, evaluating the math on an alternate cosmology, something alternate to the current standard model. And his initial investigation showed that the math works out better, that it's more consistent. That may be the model that ultimately supplants what we currently refer to as Big Bang cosmology. So whereas in the past I would say, well, of course I accept the Big Bang, I've grown a bit. And now I say, not that I accept that the Big Bang cosmo cosmological model is the truth, because science doesn't tell you the truth. It makes tentative... Best probability. Yeah, it take, makes tentative evaluations based on the best available evidence. And so all I can say about the Big Bang is, I'm unqualified to do the math and to assess it, but the people who have a demonstrated expertise in this area are fairly consistent in saying this is the best explanation we currently have and that it's subject to revision, and I'm fine with that because I'd much rather say I don't know or I'm not convinced that we've reached the final explanation than I am to say I know that I know that I know that I know that Big Bang is the explanation. Well, okay, but my question is your faith is in materialistic naturalism, 
for in the so I don't have faith in Mitt Well, okay, but you, you defend <laughs> it. Now we're back to the word that I avoid anyway. Yeah, I know, but you you strongly defend that position. Which yeah, right. because because okay. the method the 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 process by which we go about methodological naturalism of not being able to offer supernatural explanations, science has been the demonstrably most consistently reliable method of accurately describing the universe in a way that is useful and productive. Um, if another method, you know, it's, it's like if I'm crossing the street and there's a bus coming towards me, my brain is not necessarily doing calculus, but it's figuring out, you know, how fast and how fast you have to move. If we looked at the various models and there was one that said, yes, you're going to make it, and one that said, no, you're not going to make it across the street, um, that's a rather dangerous prospect. And when it comes to science, when it comes to the foundations of methodological naturalism, it's consistently saved our lives. It has consistently given us the best understanding. It's how we have vaccines. It's how we know about climate change. And we can be wrong on any number of these things. But all we can ever do is take a method, see what results it produces, and whether or not those results are useful and seemingly accurate in describing the world we live in. So I have to go with the most accurate model I have. I, you know, it, it, we, we talked before about whether or not faith would be rational as an epistemology, and I think we're in agreement that as an epistemology, it's not. Um, if somebody can come up with a better epistemology, something that's more reliable from science than, than the scientific methods, there's not a method. I don't know what it would be, but I know that they'd probably first have to demonstrate its reliableness by using the methods we currently have. It's like coming up with a, a new micrometer you would have to show that it's as accurate as the previous ones and where its benefits are. And all this is a product of demonstration. There's, there's no easy answer to it. If you want to call it faith in the sense of confidence, I have monumental confidence that the scientific methods, the critical thinking, examination, independent verification, replication, that these have consistently led us to the best understanding. They're not proclamations of truth. They're all tentative. Yeah, but the, the problem is the initial singularity brought into existence the natural. So your faith is in something that prior to the initial singularity didn't exist. Well, you could argue also, as Hawking has, that the phrase prior to the singularity is nonsense because prior is a temporal thing and time began. Uh, yeah, but then your faith in nothing. I, I, th this, th this phrasing is, is kind of the, one of the things that troubles me because now you're saying faith in nothing. Well, okay. No, I have confidence that we have the best description, that I'm accepting the best descriptions currently. But if the answer is, I don't know, then that's the answer I give. I don't know what came before the Big Bang. I don't even know if before the Big Bang is a sensible phrase, because time began with the Big Bang right. in every, that model. Every, everything natural began at the Big Bang. I, well, you say everything natural. I don't know that there's anything other than the natural. I have no reason to think that well, there's anything other than the natural. You're, you're so why put the in science? In science, the evidence points to a singularity. Okay. And at that singularity, that which is natural is coming into existence. Not necessarily. Well, okay. And I don't know. The, the local presentation of our universe begins at that point, but there's no reason to think that something like a singularity couldn't have existed. Well. Okay, you can't exist absent time, so, there, yeah. Why the hell am I talking about the Big Bang? I'm not a physicist. All I'm well, saying is have faith in something. I have confidence in something that has demonstrated consistently that it's reliable. What other method could I possibly have confidence in? Where, what other method is there that has demonstrated any reliability that is worthy of me putting confidence in it? Well, I, I don't have a problem. I have a lot of faith in science, too. I'm just saying, what else could I possibly have confidence it, it, in? It is, and this is the question. If science is pointing to a singularity, which it, we, you, you just said the current it is, one, yeah. it's the most probable theory at this time. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. At that singularity, the natural is coming into existence. The, the our local presentation of the, the natural. The singularity is everything that is natural. Well, there's nothing necessarily unnatural about the singularity. Well, time, space, matter, material, laws of physics are all coming into existence. I guess I'm just not understanding what you're getting at. <coughs> but what's before that, it's a natural... Before that is a nonsensical phrase based on our current understanding. Well, you don't want to acknowledge the supernatural. N well, I would be happy to acknowledge the supernatural the minute somebody demonstrates that it exists. 
Well, that we we had a, I think we've had a good back and can forth. I, Would I, you like to interject? Yes. Yeah, just a few quick points. Um, you know, when you ask what method is better, what could I use? This is where I'd of course recommend these other canonical forms of reasoning: abduction. Uh, induction, deduction. Bayesian. Yeah, of course. In ba uh, Bayesian Wait, are you suggesting that I'm not using deduction, induction, or abduction at all? Ba no, no, I'm sure I you're I mean, because those both, are the only but three. Those, but those aren't, those aren't under the, the scientific method, right? This I'm is talking about the scientific broad. method with regard to coming to the best understanding of the material world. I'm fine with abstract arguments. I make deductive, inductive, and abductive arguments all the time. Okay, so this is, yeah, this is actually... In this is, I, I suppose, where it would be good for us to explore further what you mean. So it sounds like when you say science, maybe you mean something, not science technically. I'm fine with something... abductive reasoning. That's reasoning to the best explanation. Mm -hmm. But where we differ here seems to be what, could, what should qualify as a candidate explanation. So then the, here's the thing is when you say something like before I will put it into the pool of options, to infer to the best explanation. For those of you who don't know what abduction is, that abduction is short for inference to the best explanation. What you're doing is you're adding a rule onto abduction that doesn't exist um, no. in the concept. I'm not yeah, adding why? a rule to abduction. <clears throat> There's no rule about abductive reasoning about what technically should qualify as a candidate explanation. Yeah, it, every, you can put whatever you want into the pool. There are no rules in terms of what you can yeah. put into the pool. But if you give a damn about whether or not something is likely to be an explanation, you have to care about what, pro what, what criteria we use to determine what are candidate explanations. Otherwise, you end up with he can start fires with his mind as a candidate explanation. Excellent. So that goes into the pool, but it's analyzed by a virtue in inference to the best explanation called plausibility. And so in, in, in Bayesian terms, that gets cashed out in terms of prior probability. So right. there's no rule in the beginning that says you can't even analyze these or talk about it. They say let it compete. It's going to lose in the end because it's missing either a theoretical explanatory virtue or it's going to have a really low prior probability. There is no rule I, I that says it, demonstrate the possibility first. It may be telling that you think I don't know this, uh, which is cool. <laughs> What we're talking about, you can throw whatever you want in as a candidate explanation. You're correct. Um, I'm talking about whether or not it's reasonable to include things as a candidate explanation. And there's a problem here. If I list all the candidate explanations I can think of, what's the likelihood that I've included the actual explanation? Yeah, it's going to depend on... You have you're, no you're way of knowing. You're talking about inference You don't the, know what you don't know. But you're talking about inference to the best explanation just for clarity, not, not based on... But if I only know two possible, or two explanations that I throw in there, the <laughs> inference to the best one is going to come up with one of those. But what if there's a thousand or a million candidate explanations in there? What if the right one, what if the most plausible one is excluded because I'm not putting it in there? What if these... Uh, ex the, the candidates I'm putting in there are actually impossible and I don't know it. Like, what if, if it's impossible for someone to stare at this table and start a fire with their mind? Then it is a mistake for me to include it, especially if the actual explanation isn't there because that one can come out as the most probable explanation despite being impossible. I'm aware. And so I commend you. This is in philosophy called the problem of the bad lot. How do you know that it, within your pool of explanations, if you're focusing on inference to the best explanation, how do you know the best one is in the pool? And I think that's a great point. Um, it's one that I make when I talk to people. And there are more modest conclusions to, in inference to the best explanation than, hey, this is the absolute best. But it, there's tons of work being done on it. That's incidentally one of the reasons why I favor Bayesian analysis. Um, but in both of these cases, my point is, is that among all the academics working on it, there's nobody that says anything like, you first have to pass this test of demonstrating it to be possible. They just go at it. Which means that they're potentially including explanations that could come out as the best explanation despite being impossible. In, in inference to the best explanation despite because of impossible. the problem of the bad lot. But remember, that's this not is a where skepticism That's only comes a problem in. for some models of inference to the best explanation. Th this is where skepticism <clears throat> comes in. Mm -hmm. Because abduction is incredibly useful when you have good information. If we know that, like we had a list of all the people who were in the room, 
and we wanted to find out who stuck the chewing gum under the table. I saw you, by the way. <laughs> Abductive reasoning, we could enter everybody here as a candidate. We could also exclude Trump. He wasn't here. So we know that we can exclude him. But what if something happened that we didn't know about? This is, this is the problem of the bad lot, whether or not the right answer is included. What if somebody who wasn't aware of this pool included a unicorn in the lot? And it turns out that unicorns are defined as animals that love to chew gum and put it underneath the table. Then all of a sudden, by definition, this becomes the best, the most probable explanation from our pool, despite the fact that it should have never been in the pool to begin with. I understand that's not really a problem because what you're supposed to do with abductive reasoning after you go on, when you're, when you're making this Bayesian analysis just towards the best explanation, you are supposed to gather more and more data. You are supposed to make sure that you can do your best to exclude the answers that shouldn't be there and appropriately weight the ones that should be. That is the skepticism in action. But the time to say, I have concluded that I have the best explanation is once we've gotten to a point where we've eliminated the likelihood or minimize the likelihood that we have flawed explanations in the pool or impossible explanations in the pool. And after we have enough data, I don't see how this applies when we're talking about, you know, the possibility of God and other things as explanation. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're disagreeing with anything that I said previously. Are you specifically Not about the reasoning. I'm, I'm, well, I'm disagreeing with the sense that you, you thought I was opposed to abductive reasoning or using this pool. All I'm talking about, abductive reasoning is useful. It is a guide that can get you towards possible, probable explanations. Uh, but the time to believe that you have the right explanation uh, is after there's actual evidence for it and you've done your due diligence. This is why we rely on deductive reasoning more than inductive reasoning, more than abductive reasoning, by and large, for understanding the world. Would you make one more comment about it? Is there another person with a question? Yeah, make one last comment about it and then we'll move it. Yeah, I, w I would just reiterate that, of course, if you use uh, um, abductive reasoning, set aside Bayesianism for now, which is my favorite, but if you use abductive reasoning, then, of course, you do your dilig due diligence and stuff. The point that I was making is that in none of this is there ever a step where you first ask, is this a possibility? That's I'm, not, I'm not saying that is a step in abductive reasoning. I'm saying it's a, it's a step in analyzing whether or not your abductive reasoning has led you to the right conclusion. It, as I understood, and I apologize, let me ask, you first, in order, before it can even go into the pool to apply abductive reasoning, you have to demonstrate that it's a candidate before it can even get into the pool. No, you have to demonstrate that it's a candidate before you can conclude that it's the most probable explanation, not before it can go in the pool. You can put whatever you want in the pool. Okay. okay. Next question. That's where my brain shuts down, so just give me a <laughs> No, you're fine. So, uh, um... Uh, uh, first, I wanted to put out the observation that, that the, the roadblock that y'all might be running into when you're, when you're debating, um, that I run into with, with debating atheists versus somebody that believes, is um, I get a lot of, you get a lot of assumptions that atheists believe that God is a supernatural creature, um, if that God is a supernatural. And that's a reasonable, I mean, that's a reasonable expectation because that's kind of the standard that everybody holds God to. Um, but to move forward with the debate, it might be a valuable uh, tool to assume that God is not a supernatural entity of some sort and that it doesn't defy the laws of, the laws of physics and, that, um, and then start debating um, the merits of faith and the merits of God based on God as, a, um, as an existing or previously existing entity or, th or thing. So I, I can uh, jump into that. And actually, it's, it's related to kind of what was being talked about before, God is traditionally defined as something that's not temporally prior to the natural world, but is in fact logically or causally prior to uh, the world. So that's the relationship between God and the universe or God and the natural world. Um, when we talk about the natural in particular, to, I mean, there's debates over what exactly people mean by this. What is naturalism? What's involved? Typically, though, you're going to want to frame it in terms of mathematics. So you're going to have your initial conditions, uh, your starting entities, and you're going to want to say that the whole story can be told by applying the laws of physics to those entities. Now that's one notion of, of naturalism that's, that's popular, but on that notion, God wouldn't be natural because God can't be described by mathematics. So I would have a problem with calling God uh, natural. 
Um, I'm so, glad you said that because I was sitting here going, gosh, here he is saying atheists, you know, kind of uh, assume that God is supernatural. And I'm like, I not only assumed that as an atheist, I assumed it when I was a theist, and so is almost everybody I've ever had this conversation with. Yeah, so. no, I, I, yeah. That, yeah. Like I said, that's, the, that's kind of the default. Is, is, Email me sometime is, about a natural God because, you know, if you just want to say like margaritas are God, I'm like, I, I agree with you. They exist and they're awesome, but I don't think they deserve all of the, the entirety of the label. <laughs> yeah. So, well, um, and it's, it's, this is a little bit separate from the question that I had. So, um, the the example that that I that I've that I've given in the past for for God for using God as a um, as an as an approaching the argument of is God. There, is there a question point. involved with it? Yeah, there is a question involved. It's, okay. it's a little related. Sorry. Um, so, you create and you create an AI. That AI is capable of doing everything that humans do. It evolves, it grows, it learns, it, it, it eventually learns. It, it's capable of reproducing itself. Um, you put down the, the limitations of its universe is that table. Maybe they're nanite scale, whatever it happens to be. Um, but you've set the universe at that scale. 10 million generations later, this AI has no idea you exist, but you do. Um, and so the the... The question actually, the question that actually comes down to is, can you rationalize the unknowable? So I have no, I have no way of proving right now. You didn't describe stand. something that was unknowable. You described something that was unknown. Yeah. There's a difference well, between okay. unknown. If I created a bunch of nanites AI and the, their universe is this table, um, unless you put some, and they can do everything humans can do and think, et cetera, unless you put some limit on it that you didn't describe, there's nothing preventing me from communicating with them anytime I want. There's nothing in the God models that's preventing God from showing up right here and demonstrating himself. The fact that he doesn't, I think, is evidence that he doesn't exist or doesn't want us to know he exists. Either way, that's not my problem, just like it's not the nanites' problem. Yeah. But are they justified in not believing, not accepting that I exist? Yes, as long as I don't demonstrate myself, they would be, they would be unjustified to believe that I do exist. So, well, and that's the question. Is, is it... Is there any way to rationally justify that the nanites on the table theorize that you exist in some way or have a hypo uh, Oh, I think I it's... The, is the wrong th this is what we're talking about with regard... Hypothesis and hypothesis. This is what we regard to... Rationally. This is what we were talking about earlier. Uh, the nanites here, there may be pathways, especially with limited information, where it might be entirely rational for them to conclude I exist. It would happen to be the case that I was right. But whether or not I exist is independent from whether or not they are engaged in rational thought to reach the conclusion. The question is, um, if they have access to, what's the best phrase for this? We were talking about earlier before about a least common denominator and not having enough information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we took the pool of information that was available to them and their understanding of their universe, if they, were, if they could do everything that humans can do, so we're going down that road. Um, I think that it would be that they, they could come up with no universal rational justification for accepting that I exist if I'm not actually offering any evidence that I am. Their existence alone is not enough to infer it. Now, there may be something specific about this universe that, uh, oh, the only way, I mean, they, they learn enough about the laws of physics that this just can't happen unless we are a table in a universe type thing. Yeah. Uh, well, that would, if I mean, we go down that that's route, a parallel analogy to a yeah, it may be possible like that. that they could they could come up with something that is an, an inference, but it would also be something that's kind of demonstrable. In this, not, not, demonstrable doesn't mean hey, I can pick it up and show you. It's about you know you, everything you learn, you're going to learn through your senses, but you can have a reasoning that's abstract. Yeah. Um, so the question, the, the answer is. I have no idea what's necessarily rational or irrational for those because we can't sit here, we don't have time to go through all the potential information they have. But if you want to make this analogous, then we're right back where we started at the beginning of the debate. I'm an atheist. I don't think it's justified to believe that a God exists. I think every argument that's been presented in, in favor of it has flaws. Uh, I think the methodologies that they're being espoused have flaws. And Blake thinks the same thing with regard to my methodology. So, Blake, do um, you have any comments for the name that's on the table? No, I'll no, let that one stay on the table. <laughs> well, um, what, what we're going to do, I, I think there's one more person with a question. 
I'd like to go ahead and go, go to him if we could do that and keep moving because we're going to do some closing remarks if we could do that. Thank you so much. I'll, thank I'll you. try and be more succinct on this last one. <laughs> Hello. I uh, came in about an hour ago, so I miss uh, both of you uh, give your presentation. Uh, but my question had to do with the title of the uh, topic tonight. So I wanted to know how each of you define both faith and rational um, in your presentation, um, because in, in my mind, when you, I think that faith needs to be unpacked. Like it's a little more than confidence, and I know that you prob Matt probably understands that, and he's just doing it for I can do um, this real fast brevity purposes. But um, I promise. Yeah. So. By and large, faith is referred to as confidence. That's how the believers tend to view it. I also found an instance where I think it's re referred to as sort of the epistemology, the foundation, the evidence. Blake challenged that. And what I said was that if faith is just confidence, then of course confidence can be rational. If it is more than that, if it is epistemology, then I don't see how it can be rational. And Blake actually agreed with that as well. Mm -hmm. There was no actual presentation because uh, uh, he filled in at late notice, and so we just decided we'd talk. So yeah, it's kind of complicated, and the thing that I think we both, or I stressed, but I think he agrees, is that we should probably do a better job of making sure we're clear with all kinds of language, not the least of which is faith when we're using it. I, in my experience, have people telling me that faith is the, the, the thing they go to when they don't have a good reason. Uh, he was arguing that from a far more academic standpoint and from 91% from of Christians polled, that they don't mean blind faith at all. They think they have good reasons, and of course atheists don't think they have good reasons, which is why we're going to keep doing these debates for, well, till one of us convinces the other at least. Yeah, so long story short, we actually did cover precisely that before you had arrived, and, and I think we agree that at least a, a common understanding of Christians when they use the word faith is that it's pretty much analogous to trust. And there will be a video. Well, you yeah, you can watch the video, they'll, pub they'll publish right. this online on YouTube. As well. my, my last question for Blake is, 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 there, is there ever a point in a, Christian, in a Christian's life that faith is so at odds with reason uh, that we should actually abandon faith in cases like um, the mother in early 2000 in Houston who drowned her children because she said that God told her to do so? How does a, how does a Christian approach those sort of cases where you're dealing with the purely subjective. Yeah, I, I can absolutely see someone who rationally should um, abandon faith. Um, you know, again, the, the whole Bayesian thing is you can have evidence for and you can have evidence against, and despite where you start, you deal with evidence enough and it's going to take you towards the truth, and maybe that truth is there is no God. Um, so in that circumstance, yeah, I think, I think that can absolutely happen. God, I'm going to sound bite that. <laughs> <laughs> For fun, not, not to make you look bad at all. <laughs> Thank you. Well, do we have any comments uh, in the dialogue that y'all like to wrap up between each other, or do you want to move into some closing remarks? Do we even want to do closing remarks? I, I'm, I, well, just anything you want to close up with. It's not like a closing statement or anything official. Oh, I'll make this easy and quick since I will sure. talk forever. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to doing this again, either in public or come down to the house and we could chat about the stuff that we do. I, I, I already said enough stuff about how I actually, uh, I love the fact that we, we can disagree and how we disagree. And uh, it's always instructive for me and I hope it's instructive for other people. Yeah, yeah and I, of course, echo that. I love these conversations. I, um, it's good to explore truth together. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're, we're all, everyone here, ideally, is, is on the same team in the sense that we can look at each other as being mistaken. We have uh, bad information. But at the same time, we're all here because we're interested in the topic. And we're um, interested in, hey, maybe there's a thought that I hadn't come across. Um, I, we enjoy seeing that play out. And so in, in that sense, there's, there's a camaraderie here. And I think that, that we should uh, build into that. And, and I appreciate everyone so much uh, for inviting me to be a part of it. And yeah, thanks you guys for well. coming. Yeah. Let's give our participants a round of applause of appreciation. <laughs> thanks so much for coming out. You're dismissed. That's on tape. <laughs>
This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.